Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this fun Fellowship Friday for the Church of the Eternally Secure, uh, CES. <laughs> Woo! Let's have some fun tonight. I could use it. Keep your promises. All right. Um, let me see. We've got... Uh, well, we're we're missing Steve. Uh, maybe he'll be joining us. He didn't he didn't let me know. But we we have uh, uh, Angel, Heather, Lisa, Ben, and myself. And it looks like in the chat room, uh, we've got a lot of people raring to go. So let's before we get into the uh, true false uh, subjects, uh, let's say hello to everybody. Uh, why don't you go ahead and start, Sister Lisa? Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Glad to be with all of you this evening on Fun Fellowship Friday. I was looking forward to this all week. I have been anticipating it, and I'm ready to go. Looking forward to the questions we have tonight. Shout out to everyone out there in the chat. God bless you all. I hope you guys have fun tonight. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I'm glad to hear that you're looking forward to it all week. I'm really happy to hear that. Uh, Sister Angel, how about you? Sorry, I probably, you're going to hear beeping because I didn't get to buckle my seatbelt in time before I, I hit on mute. I'm driving um, and my car snitches on me when I'm driving it without a seatbelt. It beeps. Uh, surprise, it doesn't notify the police. <laughs> so annoying. Um, but um, I'm doing good. I... Um, I was uh, very, uh, very pleased with the list of questions that we uh, got tonight. So I think it's going to be interesting. Um, I, I'm on my way back from the store because my, my little one, my Gracie, she has a, a problem with her eye and she's feverish. Her, her eye is really bothering her. So I had to run out and try to find something drops for her eye. So there's a chance that I may have to leave a little bit early tonight just in case, she, like depending on how she's doing when I get home because she's the worst mama's girl. Uh, last week, my other, my other, my younger three was um, not feeling well. Uh, everybody's just fighting something off. Not getting actually, actually getting sick, but uh, you know, every it's like every week it starts to come back uh, in one or the other, and and you know, uh, it's rear its ugly head, and I have to feed it back again with supplements and stuff. But we also got you know two little parakeets, so there's a chance that they're you know having allergy issues because those little birds put off a lot of dander. So anyway, um, I am glad to be here. Hopefully if Steve maybe joins us late, he might be able to kind of pick up where I might leave off if I end up having to go. But, uh, and uh, I'm gonna buckle up just because I mute my phone so that won't happen again the beeping. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sister Angel. All right, Sister Heather, want to say hello to everybody? Hi everyone. Um, it's just been a crazy week and I'm really glad to be here. Um, like sister Lisa said, I really do. I look forward to hanging out with all of y'all, um, for everything that we have. Um, but this one is one of my favorites, so I'm excited. Good questions tonight. Yeah, I'm sure you think they're good since you probably created them, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, but yeah. One, okay. The rest are the rest are really good too. I'm very excited. All right, great. Uh, okay, Brother Ben, say hello, please. Yes, hello everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, looking forward to the uh, fellowship tonight, and I I agree we have some good questions. Uh, and Angel, I would say this. Um, a lot of times I I'll, I will have like an allergen in my eye, and it seems like it's something you know, uh, something internal, but it's actually just been kind of allergen um, irritating yeah. it. And so a lot of times I just yeah, um, she's just a little feverish though. Is the only okay, thing, which okay. Is, yeah, I mean I think she could have just been hot from being upset about her eye. You know, sometimes they get a little like you know flustered and heat up. It's hard to tell. I didn't take her temperature. I just felt her, you know, it's like a weird mom sick sense. But I'm I'm trying to make sure she's uh, okay tomorrow because we're supposed to go to the the uh, Central Indiana Cage Bird Club. Uh, I got invited by the the breeder actually to go with the girls, and they would have such a, a fun time because there's a bunch of parrots and owls and cool stuff that people bring. So that's the, that's why. But yeah, I mean, uh, you like I get stuff in my eye too, and then I'll sit there for an hour trying to get it out. I don't know about you, Ben. It's so annoying. Yeah, a lot of, but yeah, exactly. So I do get things in my eye, but also too, sometimes it's just a matter of going downstairs, taking some soap and water, 
and rinsing it out is, is fine. So I don't know if that's it or not, but uh, might be worthwhile. But looking forward to the uh, uh, program tonight. Okay, me too. Um, real, real happy to uh, be able to do this. Of course, on on Wednesday, two days ago, uh, we were unable to do the uh, Wednesday night Bible uh, study. And if whenever we do miss a, a program, and then I'm always even more eager for the next one. Um, I remember uh, the the three programs that we have each week. Uh, we went almost three years. Uh, without at least me, I, I I didn't miss a single program, three programs a week for almost three years with ever never missing one, and I was, and it wasn't because I felt like, uh, you know, some legalistic requirement. It was just that gosh, I always wanted to be here, and I, it, fortunately, I was always able. Um, but recently, we've because I got the COVID, and then then other other things, but. Uh, we've had to cancel several of them, and I'm really sorry, everybody, that we we've had to do that. Hopefully, that's the end of it, and we'll we won't have to cancel any more programs. Um, let me say one thing that before we get started, I I don't want to uh, I don't want to come off as someone that's like always trying to lecture everybody, but I I do think that it's important to kind of um, remind everybody that uh, this this is a church program. Uh, it, it's uh, Friday nights is a church fellowship program. That's what it's for. That's what it's supposed to be about. Uh, so, but with with the the recent events uh, in the United States, uh, uh, it might be very tempting for some people to come into the chat room and want to talk about that or. And uh, I'm going to ask you to refrain and, and not talk about it. It's obviously very important, but we just don't want it here. We we want to have fun tonight, and we don't want to have any political debate. So um, I'm going to ask the moderators, uh, uh, Kevin and Victoria. I don't let me see. I don't see uh, Hendricks in there yet, but please keep an eye. If someone does come in there and start mentioning what's uh, happening in America right now, uh, then please um, um, uh, let's let's not allow that to uh, come into the chat room. I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, okay. A anything before we get into the questions, anybody? Uh, all right, then, Ben, why don't you uh, why don't you read the first question to us? Okay, the first question is, True or false, Abraham never doubted. God, uh, Abraham never doubted God, is, is the question. And I think the links are working in YouTube again, so I will post that in chat, and hopefully everyone will uh, cast their vote. Okay, um, I guess I'll go first, if you don't mind. It's um, I remember um, this, uh, remember when we had the, the problem with this, what they called the doubtless gospel, and uh, fortunately, uh, that's uh, no longer part of CES. But there was an argument uh, uh, in the past about uh, uh, people, do, do people ever doubt? Uh, and uh, are there any cases in the Bible where people have doubts about their salvation? Or And uh, one of the things that came up was, uh, well, in the Bible, certainly the book of Galatians is about people who go into apostasy they're real believers and and yet they get led astray into a kind of a lordship salvation where they it's faith in jesus plus practice in judaism uh and so and then there's many other cases um uh, and and uh, there was um between uh, the different parties they were arguing about it if some of the significant uh, people in the bible ever had any doubts uh, and this is one of the points that was brought up then. And I, I believe that uh, um, Abraham and uh, Sarah, before, um, before um, uh, Isaac was born, uh, they reached a point where they doubted God. Uh, and God promised that they would have a, 
a, ch a child and it would uh, lead to a uh, offspring to be a, a great nation uh, and a, a, a blessing to the whole world. So this is a promise from God. And I remember God stating it um, more than once, but uh, when Sarah got to be, I think 90 years old and uh, Abraham was a hundred years old and she'd been, she was barren and, you know, women reach a point where they physiologically change and they're no longer able to have children. And that was the case. So you can understand a person thinking, well, it's impossible. I can't have any children now. So Sarah, uh, she convinced Abraham that, uh, well, let's take this into our own hands uh, and, and do it ourselves. We, we can have a child if we use our handmaiden, Hagar, and they ended up with Ishmael. But even though Ishmael was the firstborn from Abraham, that was not God's plan. God had uh, Isaac in, in mind. So, but I think what led to that problem was uh, uh, Sarah, she doubted, she convinced Abraham, he doubted God. And uh, so I would answer, yes, uh, it is true that there was a time when uh, uh, Abraham and, even, and Sarah, his wife, were undoubted. Okay, who'd like to go next? I would. Yeah. Uh, I want to jump in for it. Somebody else got to it before me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I disagree in, in this regard, Brother Luke. I, I respect your opinion on that. And I think years ago, I probably would have said the same thing. But I spent a lot of time thinking about that, probably not even that long ago that I was really meditating on this whole concept of whether or not Abraham doubted. I don't think he did. I don't think Sarah did. And here's why. Because I think the proof is in what they named Ishmael. Had they thought for a minute that this was really going to be the seed of promise and it was doubt, which means to disbelieve God is going to make the provision, they wouldn't have named that boy Ishmael. What they got was impatience. And, and, and we've all done this. We believe God when he tells us something, but we don't want to wait. <laughs> we 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 get impatient and we want to hurry and we want to help God along. Well, I believe you, God, but now I'm gonna come up with my own <laughs> my own way of, of, of making this happen. You know, for example, if the Lord tell you I'm gonna put you in ministry, and maybe you're 20 years old, if you think back, 20 years old, and you go okay, and you get excited and you're on fire, but you didn't know that your ministry wasn't gonna start for another 30 years. He might not tell you that fact. He might not say your ministry is going to start at 50. He just say you're called, you're going to do, but you don't know that the calling is now going to be the preparation for the equipment, <laughs> the equipping and, and the grooming and the training and the learning and all of that. So even though you might be called at 20, your ministry don't begin till you're 50. <laughs> okay, I'm just giving this as an example. So this is the same thing that happened to them. He told them, they believed him, but they get impatient. And they're like, I, I'm going to help God out. Let's come up. Let's do this. But the proof was they didn't name that baby uh, Isaac. They could have, but they didn't. And they knew what that child's name was supposed to be. So they named him Ishmael because this, this was them getting the gratification for their flesh. They wanted a child. And we see the problems that they ended up created. And they realized their error, <laughs> helping God out. So I say, God, you know, he don't bless no mess, but he'll clean it up. And then uh, we, we see what happened. Even in that, even in their error, blessing to bring in a whole nother lineage of people into the earth. But um, that being said, Isaac was the seed of promise. And they didn't name that child or even try or attempt or had to be rebuked for trying to name him Isaac. They didn't even attempt it. They named him Ishmael. They knew that wasn't the seed of promise. That's why I, I believe that they didn't doubt. They just decided, we're going to help you along, God, because you're moving too slow. <laughs> we're going to do it our way. And, and you see the results. So that's my opinion on that. All right. Thank you. Um, well, uh, you know, we we're trying to give a, an initial answer uh, that is concise. And then after everybody's had a turn, we can all have a chance for a follow up where we could uh, ex expand our answer. And in the follow up, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you, Lisa, um, I, I 
thought your question was very interesting, but uh, I don't remember the meanings of the names uh, Ishmael and Isaac. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what it means and, and how why that's relevant uh, in the follow up. Uh, okay, Angel, well, how about you? What do you say? Well, um, so I would say what, I, what Sister Lisa said is, is a good point that I've actually uh, thought before. I thought about how, you know, like what really constitutes doubting God and like, you know, what we're really doubting. And I think, you know, that impatience does explain um, a lot of Abraham and Sarah's actions at the same time. Um, in a way, it's still the same thing because because uh, I, I've run into this dilemma with myself. Um, about my own, you know, I, there's no question that what I believe, uh, you know, that, that I believe the Bible is true, that God is, um, you know, uh, good and merciful, and that I am saved uh, 100%, and I, and, and I ultimately, I trust him in all ways. However, when it comes to those, uh, uh, like, your actual real-life decisions, um, and, like, you know, let's say, in, in, in uh, you know, Abraham's case, it was a very uh, extraordinary situation, but, you know, he had this promise from God, which is similar to how we have certain promises from God in scripture that apply to us as believers. Um, and, you know, we know that they're true, but because we're impatient or because like, we're, you know, we try to hurry something along or do something of our own will in our own way. And in a way that really is that's doubting that God knows best and that that his ultimate plan and his outcome, if he does it without your your health, is going to actually be end up being better for you and is actually going to be what you, you know like a, a, a unimaginably better outcome than you could have ever uh you know uh, strived for in your own will so i think that um uh it what she, you know what lisa said is very true but i think it like if you look deeper it is sort of like doubting that god knows best because if, if you're doubting his timing for instance you know because i'm sure they they believe that he would deliver on his promise but they were impatient because they were doubting about you know uh when uh, like whether it was going to be soon enough and whether you know uh, his way was going to be the best way and the most satisfying and the most uh um uh i guess yeah you well yeah i guess it's satisfying is the best way to put it like and, and i just i struggle with this all the time in my own life because of just trying to discern the difference between you know, seeing God uh, kind of work something out in my life. So the way I'll give you an example, um, like Joel recently got promoted to, uh, he's like this, the, the head of the maintenance department at a, at this big apartment complex that he worked at for like 10 years. And they, um, you know, and now he's kind of doing regional stuff too. But initially we thought it was going to just be a nightmare like it, we thought the job would kill him because his boss and close friend had that position and that's who'd been working under and he was just a mess i mean it was he was in the hospital for like heart attacks his job was so stressful and there's so much infighting between like the office ladies and the maintenance guys and all this weird subterfuge going on joel just he couldn't imagine you know living like with you know with four kids and we don't have any help in family like having this type of a stressful job um even it wouldn't be worth the money right and um so, you know he didn't actually uh endeavor to get the position when daniel quit in fact he thought he might end up quitting and getting a different job um because he was dreading it so much and now so had joel um let's say you know because daniel was offering to quit and just let him take the position for like a couple of years before this happened but Joel never uh, urged him to do that. He was just kind of patient about it. But had he, had he gotten impatient, you know, especially because he's making so much more money now than he was then, you know, and we really needed it having uh, uh, this expanding family. Had he gotten impatient at the time and not waited until everything just came together without him even trying, um, he it would have been a nightmare job because what happened was Daniel quit um, because they got a new property manager and. Daniel, for some reason, had this horrible impression of her and thought that she was just going to be the worst. And he refused to work with her because he'd been there 30 years. And he just, I guess he just, it was a complete misunderstanding. We still don't know how they had such a misunderstanding because she's amazing. She's like an awesome, awesome person. And as soon as, um, you know, Joel actually got to where he could actually sit down and talk to her, they hit it off so well and she doesn't even she doesn't even consider her uh to be his boss or you know herself to be his boss she lets him run everything on the maintenance side and 
uh, in just like six months, the apartment complex is uh, basically on the score, like that the company grades everything on. It's like the top complex in terms of how it runs, its occupancy, all of that stuff, um, and the maintenance stuff, <laughs> definitely in just six months. And all that disharmony and all the drama and all that stuff that was happening with you know the old staff is completely gone. And this was all God, I, and I know that because none of us, you know, we, we didn't try to, uh, you know, make any of this happen, just kind of happen and he went with it. Uh, but had he done this earlier, had he tried to take Daniel's position earlier, um, it would have been a nightmare still because we would have had that older prop, the old property manager, which she was a big source of all the problems. Um, but, uh, he, but Joel didn't know that. He really didn't understand that things just weren't being done properly. In fact, Daniel was really not, he wasn't communicating. He, it, like Daniel and the old property manager, they were kind of the problem. That's why everything was kind of such a mess. And um, this is just like, it was a lesson for me because uh, although we weren't really that tempted to force the issue uh, and, and like take Daniel's offer up like years ago when he was just gonna quit just for Joel's sake, um, seeing how, and this has happened repeatedly in our lives, uh, especially, you know, in the past five years since I've been a believer, I've seen this where, well, it's been five years since, yes, I could lose track of years since then. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say about five now. Um, I've seen this repeatedly, just the difference in outcome when, um, when you trust, when you just kind of give it over to God, as opposed to how I always used to be, which is always trying to control outcomes. And I see what Abraham did as, a, as an attempt to control outcomes. And so, although I do think he, he believes God would deliver eventually and that he did get impatient, I think that that in itself is doubting God's wisdom uh, about when the best time is and what will, you know, like, I think sometimes we doubt that God wants us to be as happy as we want ourselves to be, right? <laughs> I think that's kind of what we, we, we think that, that uh, you know, he'll be kind of like a wet blanket compared to what we uh, we want for ourselves and our, our little like schemes that we work up and things that we're really, you know, we get on a kick about something and we think that God isn't as excited about whatever it is as we are. He does, you know, he, he has, like, that's why he takes so long sometimes or he, you know, to deliver things, but really he makes everything work out in a way where you wouldn't even imagine how happy that you were, you know, <laughs> that you were going to end up being like, even as you were daydreaming about whatever outcome you were trying to achieve, you weren't actually imagining being as happy as you end up being when God is the one who brings it to fruition. That's at least in, in my experience, so. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Heather. Um, yes, I think, you know. I, 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 was, that, was that your question, Heather? I don't remember. Um, oh, I, know okay. that, I know that there's no, one in there mine. that is. It was oh, okay. okay. All right, then, because I, I, I didn't want you to have to go last. It's not your question. Go ahead, sister. All right. So um, I've 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 agreed and disagreed with with a lot of what everybody has said. Um, I, you know, Sister Lisa and I normally steal each other's thoughts, but not tonight, um, which is a good thing sometimes. But I I do think that that they doubted, and um, I think that Sarah doubt. I think that Abraham doubted. Um, and let me do that first. That part first. The doubt that I see in Abraham is this: he he left his homeland to go to a land that God sent him to, and had no idea where he was going, what he was going to do there, um, and when he was coming into Egypt because there was a famine in the land, he lied to Pharaoh and said that, that Sarah was his sister because he doubted, even if a little bit doubted the protection that he knew that he would have because God was the one who called him on this journey. Good point, Heather. So yes, he did doubt there. Um, and then after everything else that they had gone through, um, they, they, um, they did the same exact thing. Oh my goodness, I can't, I'm trying to remember the other king's name, but um, there was another king right before Isaac was born that they they go in and again, um, he says, this is my sister. And you know what? I think it's the most beautiful thing in the world because if they are allowed to mess up, even if even just that little bit, then thank God, because that means I'm allowed to mess up even just a little bit, you know? Um, 
And as far as um, with Abraham and Sarah, I I have read through um, this portion of scripture a lot because I'm I'm very much an Old Testament junkie when it comes to the Bible stories. Um, and one one thing that I've noticed is that God never mentioned Sarah in the promise. Never. Until right before, like the year before Isaac was born. It was always about Abraham. It was Abraham's seed and Abraham's descendants will become like the stars. And God always spoke directly to Abraham, never mentioned Sarah's name until a year before Isaac was born. So Sarah, I can imagine being a wife, keeps hearing these reports from her husband of how God has told me this and God is, has um, promised this. And I know because I, I, have, I have been in that position where you hear these great things, but you don't see your own self in the future, in, in the promise. So you set yourself aside out of love for your husband and out of love for the Lord and out of trust of that somehow this is going to work, even if it doesn't include you. And she promoted her handmaid to take the place of the child's mother, not knowing that God had a blessing for her too, because years later, after Ishmael was about 13 years old, God showed up and, and in person and told her that she was going to, well, told Abraham and she heard that she was going to be the mother of the promised child. And she laughed about it because she did not believe it. And then out of fear, denied that she had laughed. And the Lord said, yes, you did laugh. That laughter to me was disbelief. So did Abraham doubt? Yes, he did. Did Sarah doubt? Yes, she did. Is it okay that they doubted? Absolutely. Were they still saved in the end? They would not be listed in the Hall of Fame in in Hebrews if they were not saved. Okay, that settles it then. <laughs> okay, um, just that was a joke. A good answer though, but we still have yet to hear from Ben who wrote the question. So Ben must have the right answer, right, Ben? Let's hope so. No. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm probably going to take a slightly different take as most people do, as I usually do. But um, And some of the things I'm probably going to say, people are probably going to say, oh, Ben, you're taking it too far, and I'm, I'm convinced I'm not. Um, again, I think the Bible puts things in the things that stand out in the Bible, like a sore thumb or that cause you to check uh, yourself or w what you're reading, I think are put there for a reason, so you'll stop and consider. I think a lot of times uh, believers, you know, when they're reading it, they fail to, to consider... Okay, what was the motivation of the person who was saying that? What was God's motivation? What was the person's motivation? What were the circumstances? And again, I, I try to pierce as deeply as I can and, and squeeze as much juice out of Scripture as I can. And uh, I think there are some occasions where uh, uh, Abraham doubted. I'm not going to uh, cite the ones that um, that were already cited. But uh, if you just take the first example of, of Abraham being declared righteous, it's in Genesis 16, verses 1 through 9, and I'll just quickly read those. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, this is before he was called Abraham, but Abram, in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my own house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and, and he accounted it for him, to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, 
Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought out these things to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite each other, but he did not cut the birds in two. So a couple things that, that I think are important to that that are important about this passage. Uh, again, it's the, it's the verse that people always go to that uh, where Abraham was accounted for righteousness, which is again justification, uh, which is salvation, eternal salvation. A couple things. One is uh, Abraham, when God said uh, promise him an heir, he did not say it's going to come from Sarai or Sarah. He just said it's going to come. I'm going to give you an heir from your own body. So it, you know. Ne not so when he he uh, took things into his own hands with Hagar, uh, he didn't. It wasn't necessarily an act of disbelief. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with people saying that. I'm just saying uh, it being you know a critical person who's going to come. You know, devil's advocate. Not that I would ever ever cape for the devil, uh, but if I were to be devil's advocate, some people would say, well, you know, hey, well, he didn't necessarily doubt. He was uh, just taking things into his own hands. And, you know, they may or may not have a case there. But, um, like I said, it was only that God only told them up to that point that it was going to come from your own body, not from which, which wife. One, no, that's number one. Um, number two, and this is kind of minor. Uh, again, just throwing this out there. It's not part of my case at all. But when God said, to, you know, I want you to, you know, get yourself up and, and uh, go to a land where I will show you, uh, you know, you know uh, leave your family. Uh, he didn't necessarily leave his family. His father came with them and Lot came with them. So some people could say, well, that was an act of doubt or an act of disobedience because he didn't leave his family behind, but he took some with him. Um, again, this minor. But here's the thing I really wanted to get to. Um, this, I think, is profound, and I don't think, again, I'm reading too much into this whatsoever. Um, I think this is a put in there for a very, very uh, good reason. Uh, because Abraham is is the uh, the example for us put up in scripture as the person, you know, the champion of faith. Uh, but again, even he, I believe, was a man just like us and a nature with a nature just like ours. And he doubted just like everyone else. Um, the difference is, is that he believed the right message at the right time. Uh, it, it, you know, so it only takes a momentary act of faith. And if you listen here, if you what, read this passage carefully, he says, you know, when, when he's, again, he's asked, telling God, hey, I, I have no offspring, I have no heir, and God says, well, look to heaven, again, look look to the heavenly, look to the eternal, he looked to the heavenly, look to the eternal, look to the stars, which are a picture of, you know, uh, you know, we're all essentially, Jesus said that we're all going to be, uh, we're all going to shine like the right, in righteousness, like the stars, it's, it's a picture of, uh, it's our type of of the heavenly uh, life, essentially. In fact, the ancient world believed the stars were living. Uh, they they saw that they, uh, they they saw that they moved and things like that, and they, they they actually thought they were living. So, anyways, Abraham is looking to the stars. He sees the stars. God says, "You so so will your descendants be." And elsewhere in Scripture, He says, "Your set descendants will be at the sand of the, the sand of the." Uh, as many as this, your descendants will be as great as the sand, the grains of sand or whatever. But that's later on. I'll get into that in a second. But um, again, the this the, he's looking to the heaven. He says, look now towards heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. So shall your descendants be. So Abraham believed that. And so again, he was looking to heaven. He saw the stars. And he says, so shall your descendants be. So God right there is promising him that uh, he's promising a continuance of life, essentially, or, a, you know, he, he's promising him uh, a blessing. He's giving him a blessing uh, in relation to uh, continued life. Um, and so, again, it's, it's a type for uh, the gospel. Okay, so, again, he, he and so it's right, it says, uh, so shall your descendants be, and then right next sentence it says, and he believed the Lord, and he accounted him for righteousness. So Abraham didn't try to wiggle with it and say, well, what about this, what about that? No, he just believed that God counted his righteousness. So he's lo he's looking into the stars again. He's looking into the heavenly. I think again, it's a picture of him being in the spirit essentially. But right after that, I think he flips flipped right back into his flesh because he the next promise he says. Then he said to him, uh, God said, "I am the Lord who brought you out of the, out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit." So now God switching it into the earthly, and then and then Abraham said, "Lord God, how shall I know I shall inherit it?" 
Why did he say that to his previous uh, promise about how your son shall be? He didn't ask any questions. He just believed him. But now, again, he, he's slipping into the flesh like the Jew. It's a picture of the Jew, but also any believer that slips into the flesh. How will I know I should inherit it? You know, he, he, he's questioning God. He's, he's doubting God. And so God said to him, bring me to Heifer, etc. So he, he, God says, again, he's flipping back into his flesh. Now he's insisting that God, uh, you know, he's walking by sight, no longer walking by faith. And he's saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this ritual, fancy ritual uh, with uh, with this covenant where I'm going to, you know, something needs to die. Um, and again, when, it, when in the ancient world, when they did covenants, both parties offered a sacrifice and they would walk in between the cut pieces to indicate this is what's going to happen or what should happen to either party should they break the terms of the covenant. So again, I think you seek after a sign. Exactly, that's exactly my point. And uh, and so again, I think I think this is very this is very curious. You know, get, he didn't didn't make any qualms or you know uh, any fuss about uh, again. So shall your descendants be? Uh, but when it comes to land, <laughs> uh, that's that's far more significant. Or I mean, he, again, he 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 slipped right back in the flesh and walked walked by sight. So I think that is a clear indication that Abraham. Flip, uh, flip back into the flesh just like we all do. Um, number two. Um, uh, okay, like I mentioned before, Sarah, uh, he, God never said what 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 um, what wife he would give him, give uh, provide him a, a descendant. Um, but in Genesis seventeen fifteen through nineteen, uh, it says, "Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, again, this is the next chapter." Uh, and and I, I think several decades had, had transpired. Uh, as Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give you a son by her. So that's his first instance of he saying even that she's going to give you the son. She's going to give you the descendants that are going to be as the number of the stars. Uh, whereas Ishmael's descendants are going to be the, of the sand of the, uh, of the sand. Again, that's an earthly thing. Um, and then he said, I will bless her, and she'll be a mother of nations, kings of peoples it shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And again, he's thinking this to him into himself. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So God is even saying, No. Uh, how can this be? I, I'm a, I'm a hundred years old. Sarah's ninety years old, and God just use Ishmael. Make I I don't trust I don't trust that you're going to make you're going to uh, make a, uh, this future child. Uh, that I don't I can't believe that Sarah is going to have a child. You already had you already gave me Ishmael. So why don't you just make this blessing this covenant of of um, you know the, the sun being the number of the stars of the, of the sky. Why don't you make that on Ishmael? And then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear shall bear you a son, and you shall name his, call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So, again, when pe Ishmael by the way, means, means he laughs. And again, uh, Sarah laughed when she heard the news. Uh, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And people laugh when they, when they hear something absurd. You know, he doubted. I believe he doubted because he thought it was impossible. And just in case, um, uh, and, just, and again, in the old in the Old Testament, when a blessing was bestowed on somebody, it was irrevocable. Just like uh, when Esau was uh, blessed, I'm sorry, Jacob was blessed in, uh, instead of Esau. You know, it wasn't like uh, Isaac could say, "Oh, I, that made a mistake. You tricked me." No, it was it was irrevocable. Just like the gifts and calling of God are without repentance or irre irrevocable. When a blessing was made, it was forever. It was no taking it back. And that's why uh, Esau cried with many tears. It says it says in Hebrews, but he found no repentance, even though he did uh, sought it diligently with, diligently with tears. Because he knew there was no giving it back. Once a, once a once a covenant is cut or a, a blessing is made, there's it's irrevocable. That's what it way, way it was in the ancient world. It was it was sacred, unlike you know our profane society. Um, and so I believe again, I, uh, I Abraham knew that the irrevocability of it, and that's why he said, "No, I don't want I don't want to trust you and and, and wait on uh, Isaac to be born for you to confirm this covenant to bestow this blessing. I want you to give it to Ishmael now." So I again, 
I, I believe that's a clear um, indication. Again, looking at motivation, look at all the things, the, the, the dynamics of the story. It's a clear indication that God, uh, 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 Abraham doubted God in both th that case with Ishmael and with, um, with regards to looking at the stars and, uh, you know, saying, oh, how shall I know I should, shall inherit it when it comes to the land? Again, that was walking by sight thinking about the earthly things, a picture of the Jew, a picture of the flesh that wants to walk by sight, as opposed to looking at the heavenly and trusting and believing and not requiring any covenant be cut or just taking God as his word. It, I think it's a clear example of God taking God as a word as opposed to making God uh, uh, obligate himself through some uh, covenant. So I thought that was interesting. All right, thank you. All right, everybody's had a turn so we can have a, a follow up, um, Lisa. Would you uh, answer my question about the names? I mean, I, I, after what Ben said, I I'm recalling now that uh, I'd forgotten that uh, Ishmael had already been born and been named when uh, this other occasion uh, where Abraham was uh, uh, his it was the question is did he doubt God at that point when they. Sarah laughed, and he's negotiating with God. So I, I think I understand the significance of the names now, but uh, it seems like Ishmael was already named. And it was, Go ahead, Elisa. Okay. Um, Isaac means laughter, as has been pointed out. And Ishmael means, uh, depending on how you work it out, either God, the God that hears, or uh, God will hear, okay? Now, um, which is exactly what ended up happening when Sarah, excuse me, when Hagar cried out in the desert, God did hear them and answered her cry and blessed uh, Ishmael just as he had promised Abraham he would do. But uh, I, I heard everything that Ben said, very, very good breakdown. I think I misunderstood the question in this regard. I thought we were specifically talking about as to whether or not Abraham and Sarah doubted God, not ever in life, but specifically concerning the promise of Isaac. So the way that I answered the question was based on that. And I explained why I believed I don't see that they truly doubted him. I think they wanted to help God out and hurry along, and they came up with their own way of bringing about a son, but that ultimately the proof that they did not believe that that this was the seed of promise was that they did not name him Isaac. Now, if uh, you go back and look in Genesis 18, that's where Sarah actually ends up laughing because she's listening when the visitation comes. And the Lord declares that Abraham is going to have a son. And that's when she laughed because she knew how old she was and how old he was. And I know it must have seemed an incredibly strange thing to them. I get that. But I do believe that they believed God. They just, as we would say, stumbled or we call it wavering. It's like um, you believe something. But it's you, you, how, how would I want to phrase this? You, it's over here on pause, but you're going to do your own thing kind of thing. It's not that you disbelieve God. That's why I pointed out it's like their way of trying to move things along by their own extrapolations. And every time we've ever done that, even in our own lives as believers, that's when we mess stuff up because God don't need our help. We're just supposed to wait on the Lord. And they decided we're going to help God out, and they came up with their own plan. Now, as far as Abraham not knowing who the seed was going to come from, I disagree because he did not have a concubine until after Sarah died, with the exception of them both agreeing that he would take Hagar based on their customs. It was permitted. And he decided, okay, I'll take Hagar and make a son. If you go back and read it, you'll see this is true. He didn't take up with any other woman after Hagar until after Sarah's death, which was Keturah. So um, I think he absolutely understood 
because he, he Abraham wasn't a womanizer, that his seed was going to come from Sarah. They were one flesh. They married. I think he knew it. But again, when you start talking about uh, when he was afraid for his life and things like that, that's a storm at the moment. And sometimes people can lose sight of things and they didn't keep focus on what the promise was or they wouldn't have, have wavered at that moment. I think he absolutely believed God and then it was going to happen. And I don't think he ever did waver in that. But we can we can waver on other things in life. We do it as believers. Something happens. Uh, you lose your job. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do? Right. But you did not no longer believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You just wavering at that moment, forgetting your God is bigger than the storm at hand. So at that moment, you are doubting, but you're not ultimately doubting all of the promises of God. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to, to express it in this regard. And this is what I was talking about when I was considering how they they didn't even attempt to name that child something else. They they knew that they were promised this son. They knew that Isaac wasn't it. They knew it. Now, Abraham is a man. He loved his son. He loved Ishmael. Why wouldn't he? And when the, when the Lord said, yeah, you need to leave. When Sarah said, you need to send this bond woman away. Then the Lord came and explained exactly why Sarah was right. He said, yep, you do need to send him away. But don't worry, Abraham. I'm going to bless him. And Look what Abraham did. And this is powerful what he did. <laughs> he gives her, it shows you he believed God. What the Lord said, he believed him 100% because he took one, one loaf, one serving, one loaf of bread and one uh, bottle of water and gave it to her. And I remember thinking about this uh, years ago because I had discussed this with my dad. It's like, that's kind of cold blooded. Abraham will have all these sheep and all this different stuff. And how come he didn't give her all these other provisions? And my father said, well, I think it's two reasons. One, all that stuff really belonged to Isaac. He's the seed of promise. But two, he believed God that he was going to bless them and take care of them. So why would you need to give them anything more than just a day? If he's going to bless them and take care of them, no matter when they ran out, he's going to bless them and take care of them. So. That's why I'm saying it's like it depends on what we're talking about. Did they ever doubt? Sure, they did. But did they doubt uh, Isaac? I, I I don't believe they did. So I explained why, but that's that's my position. Thank you for listening. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, well, I got a couple of follow-up questions, but let me see if anybody wants to expand any further on the original question. Anybody have more to say about that? Um, I actually wanted to comment. I think that... I think that Sister Lisa is correct. Um, I don't think they doubted on on um, Isaac once they once they knew the plan. But I I do I do think that um, well uh, I I also disagree a little bit with what Ben said about um, not knowing which wife. According to their traditions in that time, if you were barren as a woman. It was completely accepted that you would give your husband, your handmaid, to have a baby for you. And that baby would be your own baby. It did not come from your body, but it was your baby. So Ishmael was the son of Sarah, just not born from her body. Um, according to their customs, Ishmael would have been born with Hagar sitting on Sarah's lap, making Ishmael... Ishmael Sarah's son, um, which is why when Jacob has children with his hand with um, his wife's handmaids, um, the 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 sons of uh, of um, Rachel when when um, her handmaid gave birth, she uh, Rachel named that ba the first baby and said, "God has given me a, a child ha has seen my misery or something like that and given me a child." And it was a child of hers born through her handmaid. So, um, yeah, that in that in that sense, the child was Sarah's. But God said, "No, I'm not going to use your handmaid. I'm going to use you because to, to Sarah because you are the one who the the 
promised seed is meant to come through your body, not through your customs, basically. So um, that that was the only thing that I really wanted to add to that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, some of the uh, details that you provided uh, reminds me of that. There's a TV show named the, the The Handmaid's Tale. I don't know if you've seen it. Maybe Heather. It sounds like maybe you did, but it's uh, they they use this um, this story about uh, Sarah and Hagar, and uh, that's one of the principles that it is uh, at play in uh, in this story. Uh, okay, does anybody have more to say about this before I uh, have a follow up question? Yeah, just one other quick thing, Brother Luke. Uh, mm -hmm. Hebrews eleven, uh, where it it speaks about this very thing about Abraham believing God concerning this promise, and also Sarah that she absolutely did believe. She's named in the Hall of Fame of Faith as having believed, and it is concerning uh, the seed of promise through Isaac. So I would encourage everyone to read that as well. Okay, thanks. Ben, were you were saying something? I was just going to make a couple quick points after after you make yours, that's all. Well, I don't have points. I have follow-up questions uh, for everybody. Okay, like, well, I, the, yeah. okay real quickly, I, I'll just say, um, again, I, I believe Abraham was a man of great faith. Uh, and I, I'm just saying, that, and, and I know there are verses in Romans and Hebrews that say that he did not waver in his faith and things like that, and he was fully persuaded. Um, I believe all that's true. Um, well, for, in the sense of wavering, uh, you know, I think it, it, that's the word of not wavering is kind of used in the same sense as that, uh, you know, that we're not blameless before God. You know, it doesn't mean you were perfect. It just means that, uh, you know, God wants us to be blameless before him. Not, not again, not sinless, but uh, constantly, uh, constantly growing, essentially. And uh, with regards to Abraham's not wavering, I, again, I think that just means as in the, if you were general, generally to characterize his walk of faith, we would say that he did not waver. It's not like he, you know, he ever threw on the towel and said, oh, I, don't, I disbelieve God. I do believe he probably did have momentary uh, doubts and just like anyone else. But again, whenever he doubted, he would kind of dig, dig in and, and uh, get himself out of those doubts and, and or, you know, just, just like what you know. Any time I, I, I really don't doubt anybody at all anymore. But when years that I, I, I did doubt or feared I doubted, um, it would cause me to dig in and uh, uh, fortify my faith. And uh, and I think actually that's a question coming up. Um, but uh, so yeah, I, again, I don't, I don't dispute at all that Abraham was fully persuaded, um, and that you know he didn't waver in his faith. But again, that didn't mean constant. It's just a, I think it's a general characteristic. As his life went on, his lo his trust and his faith in this world and other people diminished when his faith in God uh, increased over time. In that sense, it didn't waver. Uh, he never, you know, again, he never threw on the towel or whatever. He knew that God was in control and that even when he didn't understand, uh, especially with the sacrifice of Isaac, he, uh, God was still able to uh, keep his promises. Um but I, again, I, I I think there are cases where, like I've cited, there are moments where he he did doubt, um, and um, and also do with regards to the wife um, of where the child would come from. I guess only I only I mentioned that was that uh, I was saying that as it as a case that uh, because he had uh, 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 a child through the Hagar, that doesn't necessarily mean that he doubted. I was kind of using uh, giving an argument for the opposite side but anyway it doesn't matter you were uh, being an advocate for the devil again weren't you ben i would never advocate for the devil <laughs> that's not like something lisa would say or what <laughs> uh, okay um let me see I'll, I'll, yeah lisa followed up and said that uh who, who did we lose Is that me I, did we lose me Am I here? Can you hear me? You're here. Yep. Oh, Angel's gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Lisa, um, you, you went to Hebrews 11. And of course, we know that that's the faith chapter. And, and, and it's, I don't, what is it called? Like the Hall of Fame of People with Great Faith, that list of, I don't, there's, yeah. a, there's a name for these people or uh, Hall of Fame, I guess. But yeah, it is. Uh, Hall yeah, of Faith. People, 
Okay. Um, the point is, oh, did we lose somebody else? Oh, no, yeah. we lost Heather, too? What's going Thanks. on, Ben? I have no idea. It's not us. Yeah. They'll be okay. back. All right. Um, you know, it kind of threw me off. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so the point that uh, at, when this dispute was going on um, in, in, in CES, uh, um, um, the one side was, was said that it, it's impossible for a true believer to ever doubt or, or lose their faith. Uh, and uh, then the other position that I hold and uh, that we we as a church uh, hold and we insist we mu we must all agree on this is that, that uh, you can be a true believer and even though you're truly saved, you could have a a, a moment or even a period of time where you have uh, your faith wanes or is lost and, and doesn't, doesn't mean you, you never really got saved. So that was the the uh, the basis of the argument. Uh, and the reason it's important is because uh, there's the, the fifth tenet of Calvinism is uh, the P in TULIP is perseverance of the saints. But um, many people, if they haven't studied it, they think it's persevering in good works. But there's two parts to it, and that is perseverance in the faith and in good works. So uh, the Calvinist position is that if you're truly saved, uh, your faith will persevere. You'll never, you never have a doubt, and that you'll, you'll, you'll be successful at doing good works and getting sin out of your life. Which these things are uh, putting a burden on us that we have to keep, stay faithful and we have to do good works, and, rather than uh, having it. Hey, Jesus did it all for us. That's why it's a, a critical um, uh, issue to get right. Uh, because it becomes faith plus some kind of work. You have to work at your faith or work at your works. Um, but you do have, uh, in the, the, the people who are in chapter 11, these people truly had great faith. That's why they're there. That's why they're cited. But we have uh, uh, examples of, at least I think that Abraham, uh, he, he did have... Uh, uh, that some doubts, maybe one or more more times he's doubted, uh, but he obviously he was saved. Even though, so that's why it's uh, Abraham is an important uh, subject. Uh, did he did he ever uh, did his was his faith perfect from the time he first believed? And did, uh, because that would support the side that we'll see here. Abraham never doubted, but we say no. Abraham is an example of someone who's saved, and yet they did have a doubt. Uh, now, there's other examples, too, that we, we would bring up in our argument uh, to support our side. And, uh, but the two, there's two cases I want to get your thoughts on, uh, and that is um, John the Baptist. We know that when he was in jail and there was a time where he asked the, the question about, hey, go to Jesus and ask him if he's really the one that, that you know, we, we said he is. And uh so the question is, is, was that an expression of his, his doubt uh, or John the Baptist uh, or is something else going on there? And then some people, I won't mention a name, but, but there was one individual who was even arguing that uh, Jesus doubted in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, so I, I'd like to get everybody's short uh, answer on that, if you, if you can. Uh, did Jesus doubt God uh, in the garden, or and did uh, did John the Baptist doubt that Jesus was really the the promised uh, Savior? Anybody want to each person if you give me your answer to that too? Okay, well I like to say concerning John before I forget, uh, I think that that passage is not even it's not even when he says are, are you the one or, sh or should we look for another when he sends his servants to ask that. I don't think he's actually asking that because he doubted who Jesus was. He's the one who prophesied who Jesus was. He was full of the Holy Ghost. I think what was happening there is John knew he was about to die. And in a roundabout way, what he is asking is if the Lord is going to deliver him from death. That's what I perceive what was going on there. 
Um, and it's also that's also based on what Jesus answered was, which I don't recall in full right now. So I won't even try to quote it. But I really think that's what was going on. John didn't want to die. And he's asking, <laughs> basically, are you going to deliver me from what's about to happen to me? But um, anyway, uh, going on with uh, what I wanted to answer to about something I wanted to make sure I pointed out when you read in Hebrews 11. Uh, because there's this concept that the old covenant saints, and I can't stand it. I don't know where it came from, but I hate it. It's this concept that they did not understand that there was a Christ coming. And that's not true. They they make it about their faith. For example, this is a perfect example of the faith of Abraham concerning Isaac. That he, it was his believing God concerning Isaac that saved him. No, it was his believing God that the Christ was going to come through Isaac. Okay. So it, and I, I'm going to prove it with this one passage of scripture here with, um, and, and you can see the other scriptures. Remember Jesus said, uh, search and look the scriptures for there are those that testify of me. For example, in Isaiah, uh, perfect description of Calvary as though Isaiah was seated at the foot of the cross recording what he has witnessed that hasn't happened yet. Okay. But here's another passage that that offers a second witness, which would be if you were in Hebrews 11 and you go down and it, I'll start at verse 23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he has come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Esteeming, this is the critical verse here to let you know they understood there was a Messiah coming and they believed it. Esteeming the reproach of who? Christ. Now he's talking about Moses. But yet Paul writing this says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Now, this is something I don't understand. These people miss and they'll they'll make it about their dedication to God in faith. But they forget that they were looking forward to the promised Messiah. This is how they were justified by faith. And it's the same thing with the people who beheld Christ as he walked this earth. They had to look and see and go based on the old covenant and what was promised. This is the one. And now we, as saints of God in faith, looking black and uh, back, and we also get even another blessing because Jesus declared, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. So we look back, having never seen him with our eyes, based on the scripture, based on the revelation of Christ through this book. We receive the gospel, we believe, and we're justified by faith, by placing faith in his son. It has always been about Christ. It is He is the dividing line, because I'm going to keep reminding y'all, we go from Genesis, the beginning, to the book of the revelation of who? That's the whole name. The book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. All right. Amen. Thanks. Thank you, sister. Okay. Uh, anybody want to say more about the original question or my follow-up questions now? I do. I do. Um, I would like to just say on Sister Lisa's thing, uh, a comment that she made. Oh, my goodness. So spot on. They were not looking at their own circumstances and and believing necessarily for this one event to happen in my life. They were like you said, they were looking past that event to the Messiah. And I think that that was very, very, very well stated. Thank you so much for that, Sister Lisa. Um, I wanted to share um, about. 
John the Baptist. Um, I think that I, I, I found the verse that Sister Lisa was talking about um, where uh, she, what Jesus answered. And it's Matthew 11, verse 4. It says that Jesus told Jesus told um, John's disciples, go and tell John the things which you see and hear. The blind see, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. At the time that John was in prison, getting ready to die, there was offense over Jesus because they were saying that John um, didn't eat and drink. And they said that he had a demon and Jesus came eating and drinking and they called him a drunkard and, and a friend of sinners. So he basically, Jesus is answering John's question by saying, yes, I am without saying, yes, I am. But here is the proof that I am and tying into with into what Sister Lisa said about it being John looking for some sort of confirmation before he died that that um, Jesus was the one who would who would, you know, make this better for him. I don't know. Sister Lisa had better words for it. But anyway, um, is where he says where Jesus says the dead are raised up. So for me, that that ties perfectly in. I think I think that you hit the nail on the head with that, Sister Lisa. Oh, I'm sorry. And also um, about Jesus. I'm sorry. Also about um, Jesus doubting in the garden. I do not see doubt. I see desperation because Jesus was a man as much as we are humans. We are men, mankind. And because of that nature that Jesus had, it, I don't believe that it was doubt as much as a desire to avoid pain, if possible, even though dread. dread. Yeah. There you go. There's the word dread. Yes, it was dread. It was not doubt. Yeah, because in Hebrews, Remember in Hebrews, it points back and it talks about we have not a high priest who's not in touch with the feeling of our infirmity. Well, this is one thing you're seeing in the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter. He did not doubt. He was not afraid to go to his death or any of that. What's going on is he, Jesus is showing you, one, that he didn't have a death wish like he was crazy. OK, because there are people trying to make Jesus out to be crazy for being. Remember, he said, you know, this this cup, shall I not drink it? But this cause I came into the world. So we already know he knew he was born to die. He knew where he was going. He knew what his purpose and mission was. And it was it was to go conquer the one who had the power of death and whoop his behind. He had to enter into the realm of the dead. And that <laughs> he knew what he was doing. We know that by other scriptures, like the one that said, for if they, speaking of the devils, had known he was the Lord from glory, they would not have crucified him. OK, <laughs> so it was the greatest sneak attack in history. People talk about like uh, uh, Troy and uh, the Trojan horse and all. No, the greatest sneak attack in history was this. <laughs> they didn't even see it coming. It was a mystery to them. He fooled them. Double they think they went in. Yeah, they think they went and they had Jesus up on the cross. They think we won. We got him. And then Jesus is he's like uh, literally declaring, making decrees on Calvary in agony, making decrees like to the thief. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And imagine the Roman soldier standing there going, this man, it, it, even in agony, is making decrees like this. That's why one of them standing there goes, surely he was the son of God. So, you know, all of this stuff is as a witness to us. If we're paying attention, sometimes maybe we just need to, to close our eyes. I mean, I know you can't read and close your eyes at the same time. But if you close your eyes and imagine that you are witnessing what is being said, you pick up on nuances that you don't see if you just sit there and just read it. Because there is an experience going on right there revealed in the scriptures for us to behold the magnitude and the glory of God that is being poured out 
even as he is judging, like he said, now is the prince of this world judged. Satan's already been judged. This is why the demons and the devils hate him. And this is why they blaspheme. And you see it everywhere in the media and all this, the children of darkness, just with all their blasphemy, because they cannot be redeemed. When I say they, I'm talking about the devils, the fallen ones. They cannot be redeemed. They have been judged. Their designation is damnation. They have an appointment with the lake of fire. He came to save man. And you are the prize, beloved. You are the prize. He who dies with Jesus wins. We all, if the Lord tarries, we all have to meet death. Everyone who has went on before us, that was the designation. But if they died with Christ, they won. They beat the game. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, uh, welcome back, uh, Angel. Uh, uh, ben, um, go ahead. Let's see what Sorry you. Sorry about to say. that. Dead areas. Yeah. Dead in case you're, in case you missed it, we're talking about uh, did uh, John the Baptist have a doubt, and uh, and did uh, Jesus have a doubt in the Garden of Gethsemane? Uh, it's a follow-up right. question I asked. Uh, ben, okay. Ben, go ahead. Okay, a couple points, real quick. Um, again, Abraham. I think again. The, the 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 verses where the Bible like Romans and Hebrews were mentioning Abraham again I I, don't, I think it's the idea is you know it, it, like you said uh, Luke it's, it's the Hall of Faith chapter uh, not the Hall of Fame but the Hall of Faith chapter and it's not to, to say oh uh, you know if you if you are truly born again th this is what your life will look like or this is what how your faith will exemplify itself no he he's saying those he's saying those things is that you know th those are people we should look up to and we should uh, strive to be like them, uh, those who, with patient endurance, inherit the promise. Says plural, not promise, but promise says. And again, I think it's it's in relation to in Hebrews with ruling and reigning of Christ and, and just rewards in general, not the promise of eternal life. And and again, uh, in Romans as well, it's not to say that oh, your faith must be exactly like Abraham's, uh, unwavering and and uh, unfaltering. No, it's to summarize, to restate, and conclude that the example of Abraham's. Uh, justification by faith um, is to prove that, again that's how someone is justified before God. Not to say, oh, it must be constant or the quality of it. It's just uh, he's emphasizing that example that Abraham, you know, before he was circumcised, etc. Even for any law whatsoever, he was justified before God. Um, and also, too, a lot of people say, oh, well, you may doubt, but you may you may doubt God, but you won't doubt your salvation. Well, oh, that's convenient. Uh, how 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 can I have any faith in my if, in my salvation if I don't trust God if God's not going to change or oh uh, good point good yeah point. It, it's it's just silly um and again I do believe someone has to be fully persuaded but it, it it's a momentary it you have to be fully fully persuaded in the saving message uh and and it but it it doesn't have to it can last a nanosecond in the moment the nanosecond you believe it you're saved eternally um. So again, I, I, I think that um, that, that people abuse, use and abuse those things. But to get to your point about uh, John the Baptist, I absolutely I have to disagree, Lisa. I don't think he was asked. John the Baptist was concerning uh, his uh, deliverance, his personal deliverance from jail, because the context uh, in, uh, for example, it's in a couple places. But Matthew eleven chapter uh, Matthew eleven verse two it says, and when John had heard him in prison about the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, capital one, or do we look for another? So I, I think, again, John was asking, asked, sent his disciples to say, Are you the Messiah, essentially, or do we look for another? And that even Jesus' response doesn't suggest that, uh, that there's any, he's, he's looking for personal deliverance from jail. He's saying, No, I am the coming one by evidence of the prophesied work. That would uh, Isaiah prophesy about the works of Christ, and 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 that's why Jesus responded. Jesus answered and said to them, "Go and tell John the things which you hear and see: the blind see, and the lame walk; the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear; the dead are raised up, and the poor have got have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me." So again, the question and the response. Again, I believe John did have uh, doubts about it. Again, even after. After he said, uh, I, you know, I'm not worthy to un 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 unstrap his sandal, uh, you know, and, and behold, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin in the world, I, after he made those declarations, I believe he did doubt. Uh, I think that's a good example. With regards to Jesus doubting, absolutely never. No way whatsoever Jesus doubted. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, by, the Bible says anything not done in faith is sin. And so if Jesus doubted uh, God, who he's God, he doubted himself. I mean, but uh, if Jesus doubted, then Jesus sinned. And a, and, a, and a Savior that sinned cannot save. So I think that's a serious error. And um, absolutely not. That, that There's no way that he ever doubted. Jesus never sinned. No way, no how. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, look at my shirt first of all here. Yeah, in case you didn't see it already. Woohoo! One way to heaven, that's Jesus. Okay, um, well, I'll give you the official answers. No, um, my answers. Uh, Good one, Lick. <laughs> I, I think that, that uh, I originally thought that Jesus, uh, that um, John the Baptist doubted. He had second thoughts since he was in jail. It wasn't working out the way he thought it was going to, and he started wondering, hey, was, was I wrong? Uh, but uh, I, because of the, the, the dispute and the, I needed to study it further, I, I ended up coming to the other conclusion that uh, I don't think that John did doubt. I, I think that, what, first of all, the scriptures tell us that, that John was told by God that uh, when he sees uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, like a dove uh, above, a particular person that's how you would be able to identify the the uh, uh, the Messiah uh, so that's what uh, that's what God said would be the proof that Jesus is the one and then of course we know at the baptism of Jesus that's exactly what what happened and and so you have John the Baptist seeing this was the fulfillment of what God told him to look for so he identified him this he's the one He's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he uh, he also uh, was witness of the, the triune Godhead at that very time. He, here he has Jesus in the flesh, the, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And then you have the Holy Spirit in the manner of a dove uh, uh, ascending above him. And then you have God the Father there also speaking to him. Behold, this is my beloved Son. Uh, so... Uh, with that kind of um, a sign, proof from God, uh, I find it impossible to think that uh, what was going on here was that John actually was doubting. Uh, with that kind of proof, I think it was impossible for him to doubt. So what was happening um, in jail? Um, I, I don't think that John was uh, doubting, but for the benefit of the disciples of John who were torn, they, they, were, they didn't know what to do. You know, they were disciples of John. But now that we've got Jesus, and uh, and so and now John's in in jail, and so they were probably having doubts and didn't know what to do, and so I believe John asked the question, uh, "Go ask him this," not because he would he didn't know, but because he wanted them to hear in Jesus from Jesus' own mouth his answer, so that they could have the confidence that John had. Uh, now in the garden, uh, I agree that that was not. Uh, that was not doubt. Uh, God, God can't cannot doubt. God knows, and, and so that that was just great distress. And and what what did you call it? Uh, um, the word uh, um, trepidation. Despair. I mean, despair. Yeah, despair. Because I mean, he knew very well every detail of what he what was coming in a matter of a couple of hours. How much he was going to suffer, and so that's. That's why he was saying, Father, if there's any other way that we could do this, spare, spare me this, if there's any other way, but if not, thy will be done. But it wasn't that he doubted and didn't understand that, that know the truth. Um, all right. Um, uh, anybody want to say more on any of these three? Uh, John the Baptist, Jesus in the garden, and Abraham, uh, as far as doubt. Okay, well, we spent quite a bit of time on this question. I think it was very uh, great uh, discussion, and I think it's very worthwhile and important for us to understand these things. Um, if there's no more, I guess we can go to the next question. Okay, going in order here. 
Uh, true or false, it's impossible for anyone who believes on Jesus for eternal life not to express their faith to others. I'm eager to go, but I don't want to go first again. So who's who's eager to answer first? Actually, Luke, I think it's a, this was your question a long time ago. I'm just now getting around to it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't remember submitting it, but maybe I did. Uh, it was a while read ago. It, read, it, read it one more time, please. Okay, true or false? It's impossible. I think I reworded it slightly. It's impossible for anyone who believes on Jesus for eternal life not to express their faith to others. Okay. All right. Well, let's just, if it if it was my question, I'll go last anyway. But uh, let's see, Ben. Why, why don't you go first on this one? Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, yeah, I would say, well, first of all, it's, it, you know, it depends on how long their lifetime is, you know. Uh, some people might believe right before they die. Some people uh, might believe and live their whole life. Either way, there's no guarantee that they will uh, ever express their faith um, to anyone. Um, they, it, it could be for various reasons. One, they, they could be bitter with God, even though they have eternal life. They could be bitter about various things. Like, oh, well, why can't everyone be saved? Or uh, even though... Again, they understand the gospel. They might not just not be uh, able to reason uh, reason it through. You know why God did the way that the things that He did, or why God why God planned it is the way it is. Uh, they could be bitter about various things. They could be uh, be fearful of looking foolish to other people, um, or f fear of being persecuted. So uh, I think there's a lot of people uh, that never express their faith in Jesus. Um, even if, again, they've had 80 years of life and they are believers all that time, it, it's possible, maybe unlikely, but it's pro it may be, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible that someone could go by their whole life and not express um, their faith to others. Uh, and I, I, think, I think a lot of people, in some sense, people do. There are many people who you do not express their faith uh, to others, even though they, they are, uh, they're, they're, they're expressing their faith it's not specific. They always say, you know, that they, they, when they say, you know, they don't say praise Jesus, they say praise God, or they, they're always trying to be politically correct with the expression of their faith. In that respect, I, I see a lot of that. Um, that. A lot of people are not willing to stand uh, firm, not only on the name of Jesus, but the right gospel, so as to not to offend the, the you know, people around them. So I think there's a lot of people that do not express their faith, at least accurately, um, in the way that I think a lot of us would like to see that, to see. That's my answer. All right, Angel, what do you say? Well, I would say, um, you know, I, I see nothing in the Bible that says that. And I think that uh, really that's, you know, I, I when I first, uh, you know, like my first couple of years being saved, like I, I was so zealous and I, and I, I, I probably being, you know, unlearned at the time, I would have told you that that was my opinion or that, that, uh, you know, that I, I couldn't imagine that uh, you could be filled with the Holy Spirit and just never even feel compelled, uh, at least not compelled enough to actually follow through with professing, you know, your faith or professing the gospel, sharing the gospel. But um that's why I'm I'm so uh, thankful that I have come to a, a you know a much a much better grasp of uh, you know even though I always understood and believed the correct gospel, just really understanding how important it is not to put those uh, litmus tests on people that aren't scriptural, um, because uh, you know like I, like I've said before, if God had to count on any little aspect of our character in order for us you know it's like even the most minor thing. Uh, in order for us to be saved, then we would all be damned. Um, that's why I've said it's like the lowest possible bar. Like he couldn't even, you know, be like, you'll pass the pass the whole class if you write your name on this piece of paper. <laughs> you know, he couldn't even do that. He just, uh, you know, it, it, it's because, you know, even even if he did, you know, they like 99% of the people, you know, wouldn't even wouldn't even do it. Um, and that's, you know, that's not even really a merit based thing. That's just like, you'd think that'd be simple enough, but um, uh, I think that that's really not uh, taking into consideration uh, 
how like you know the nature of some people some people i i don't i've never related to it because i've even when i was wrong about basically everything i was i was quick to tell everybody my opinions i was very certain they were correct and i i never really related to people that were reserved or uh not outspoken um and so i've had a long you know lo long time to observe those people and really you know uh realize how some people are wired. And I do believe that is the flesh. I don't believe that, um, I, you know, I believe God does, you know, uh, wish that uh, that we would um, embrace the boldness that is offered to us by the Holy Spirit. But some people just, uh, you know, that's one of their weaknesses. Um, they don't know how to open their mouths in a lot of cases. You know, there's some people that are just very shy, very reserved, not um, like, even if they're very, you know, certain of their their faith um they aren't they aren't certain of their ability to express it or uh, it's just sort of like a you know i guess some people could call it like a social anxiety there's others that depending on the situation you know it might it might be a life or death thing um and they might in that moment uh fail to trust god enough to preserve them um and that moment could extend over a lifetime um day to day uh, there's so there's many things that you know all of us even though we're here on the panel you know different promises in scripture that you know because we, we you know we can't really imagine um or we don't feel called to do it either but i mean you know there's there's uh, all of us could afford to be a bit more bold than we are most you know most of us i'm not saying, I'm saying everybody and then there's just some people where that's just not their strong suit whatsoever um and uh you know they they may never they may never share, you know, maybe all with the closest people, but I don't think it's impossible. I don't see that. I don't see how that's scriptural. I don't, I don't see that that was like the one caveat placed on, on a person's conduct in terms of um, uh, determining their salvation as we know people are saved in a moment. So um, I, yeah, I would say that that is false. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sister Lisa. Well, I think it depends on who we're talking about, what the question when it says it's impossible for anyone who believes on Jesus for eternal life not to express their faith to others at some point in their lives. Well, it depends on who the others are. Because we know there's watchers, huh? the angels, the fallen entities, as well as the heavenly angels. And the Bible says they're witnesses to all these things. It even there's a passage in scripture that says people in heaven are rooting for us. They watching. So I was like, who who are we talking about? If we're talking about others in life, then I would say that that's false because, as someone pointed out so astutely, if a person makes a dead deathbed confession, no one even has to be in the room. You know, so uh, they might not ever get the opportunity to witness of Christ. Um. Other people, uh, depending on, like, let's say you in a country where even professing your faith would be instantaneous death. And there are countries like that. You can't even have a Bible. They catch you with it. They cut your head off. So I'm not going to hold that against that person <laughs> if they don't. I, I don't know what kind of pressure that is. They have to endure. We ain't experiencing that yet. So uh, I say false. You know, uh, it you know depends on what we're talking about. It depends on what's going on. It depends on what's really happening. But uh, I think that I think most people, if given the opportunity, most believers at some point they end up sharing their faith. Usually the first people that they even witness to are the people uh, in their own home when they get saved. But like I said, then that's relative. There's some people who are single. There's some people who don't have any family. They don't have anybody. So, you know, it's, it's whatever their inner circle is or whatever. So it really, it just kind of depends on what we're talking about. So, you know, it's leaning true in some aspects and leaning false in others. So I'm torn on this one. I'd have to say it depends. I, there's no one that says depend on what we're talking about and I'm not undecided it just depends on the situation but well, for somebody to make a, a question and say as an emphatic 
because the word it, that is an emphatic there is impossible. Well, then I would say that that's false. Um, because there are situations where it's not even possible for somebody to witness of Christ. As I, as I said, is a deathbed confession. Maybe somebody been preaching somebody forever. They in a room by themselves. They in the hospital by themselves. They've heard the gospel. They knew it was true. They denied Christ their whole life, but they know they're facing impending death. And they finally just say, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> I want, I know you real, you know, save me, Jesus. So, I I'd have to say it's false on in that scenario. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Heather. Um, I also said false. Um, and I I really liked what Sister Angel said, mainly because I am the person she she was describing. I am very shy at first, believe it or not. I am a pacifist. I'm withdrawn. I don't really speak out about stuff, but um, something that I have noticed about myself. Well, first of all, let me answer the question. The question I would say is false um, because there have been so many times in my life where I've had the opportunity to say something and I've locked up and not said anything and not because I didn't want to, but because I didn't have the words, they wouldn't come out or I didn't know how to express what I was trying to say or I was busy with something else and it was not the, the moment, the right moment, or there were other people around, or there was some other situation. But even in those situations, I found ways to show love and, and to show Jesus character um, to people. Um, one of the things that stands, one of the situations that stands out most in my mind was standing in line at Walmart and the woman in front of me gave the cashier such a hard time um, fussing at her about everything. And the, the woman was very obviously upset, looked like she was going to cry. And yeah, I probably could have shared the gospel at that point. But what I did instead is I shared a smile and I asked her about her day and I, I sympathized with her about the customer in front of me. And I listened, truly listened when she spoke to me and I loved on her to the point that before I left the store, she hugged, she asked if she could hug me and she hugged me. And so I, I believe that God did speak to her what she needed at that moment. Was it the gospel? No, but it was love. And that's what she needed to hear. Um, as far as, but, but, you know, then there are times where the same person um, I, I have found myself in a situation and it might be a little tense and I might have a little hesitation about what should I actually say, but then I find myself sharing the gospel and I'm, I think to myself, where did that come from? And I know where that came from. That came from the Holy Spirit speaking when he needed to, who, through who he needed, whom he needed to, to the person that needed to hear it. So I, I you know, I, I say absolutely Anytime that you put the word impossible or always or never or anything like that in a question, it's always it's going to be false to me. So, Okay, thanks. I guess if I'm going last, that leaves you, Ben. I went first, uh, and I was brief. Oh, you did? Yep. You went first? Yep. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, well, first I'll answer the question and then I'll, uh, 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 apparently contradict myself, but my answer is certainly false. And I answer certainly false. Basically, I would ask you to listen to Angel's answer because that, that makes, makes me answer false that, uh, we cannot impose on anyone a litmus test that if they do not share their faith, uh, or if they do not have this uh, joy that I would expect someone to have when they understand what they've got, uh, that we can't impose those those reactions or responses or from, from someone as a test. Uh, okay, uh, so for that reason, the answer has to be certainly false. Um, however, let me give you a little parable here, a personal parable. Uh, 
Uh, I made a short video years ago, and I'll, I'll repeat it now. It's only maybe two minutes, but there's a certain man, uh, Luke, uh, it's me, and my doorbell rang, and I opened up the door, and there was a, you know, a whole bunch of vehicles and a whole bunch of people, and there's balloons and people speaking on loudspeakers, and they're out, they're all celebrating, saying, hey, you have just won $10 million from Publishers Cheering House. I mean, you've, you've heard about that. This was not Publishers Clearing House. This is different. This is Publishers Cheering House. So um, they, they not only told me that I, out of nowhere, for no, uh, no reason I didn't do anything but to, to get it, but I got $10 million. And uh, then they said, and not only that, but any person that you tell about this, that then they also will get $10 million. Uh, to me, this is the picture, uh, it, 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 as, uh, in my own words, uh, of, of what uh, the, 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 our response, to give us an idea of uh, what the natural response should be. First of all, if that actually happened to me, I would be jumping for joy. Uh, wouldn't you? Come on. If, if, if someone rang your doorbell and then they say, I've got a check for you for $10 million and it's legitimate. And now you have, you would be jumping for joy. Who could not be full of joy and so happy that, wow, maybe not only could you use the money, but you can use that to help so many other people who need, need it. So you're, you're, who would not jump for joy? If someone is not full of joy, you'd have to wonder what is wrong with that person? Do they not really believe that this is legitimate? Uh, and then, and then if you're told that, hey, all you got to do is tell someone else about this, the fact that you got this, and then they can have it too, they'll get it too if you just tell them about it. I mean, who would not? Tell everybody, especially their friends and their family, you want to tell everybody, but especially those closest to you. You certainly would want them to get the $10 million too. If you didn't, how do you explain that? What is wrong with a person who would not share this good news about the $10 million? So this is how I uh, picture it as far as uh, what our response should be naturally. If we believe that we just received something that's so fantastic, the greatest thing you could possibly ever receive, far better than $10 million, eternal life, heaven, joy and bliss for eternity. Come on. I would have, you have to be joyful. And then the other, you, you would be jumping for joy. And then if you, if you didn't tell others about it, knowing that they would all also get it, then uh, I, I, that says something about you. There's something wrong with a person that would not want to share that good news with others so that they can benefit also. Uh, now, so that's how I see that this should be the natural response. And yet I cannot impo impose it on others. I'm tempted because it's hard for me to understand if someone really understands the greatness of the gift and that they got it freely because of Jesus, that if they are not jumping for joy, I don't understand why not. I, I can't comprehend that. And if they don't want to tell others about it, knowing that they can get it too, it's free to everybody, offered to everybody, available to everybody, I don't understand why a person would not tell everybody, at least the people they, they love. Uh, and yet, as much as I don't get it, if they if they don't respond the way I expect, uh, I can't impose it on them. I cannot say that if you don't respond with joy, if you don't share the gospel afterwards, then you didn't really understand it or believe it. But it's hard for me to believe how a person would not have that kind of reaction or response to the gospel. Yeah, okay. I, I, I yeah, could see ahead. someone. I could see someone like the, coming from lordship definitely having that reaction because they've been under condemnation their whole lives. But I think there's a lot of people that uh, just believe they're going to cease to exist. So what do I care if I live or die? What do I care if I have eternal life or not? It's just, I'm not, you know, it's some people, again, it, this, the sad state of affairs, it's not people are existential. Existentialism has permeated so much of our culture 
Um, and again, a lot of people are just kind of like, you know, philosophical about it. Go, oh, well, if I die, it's okay. Uh, but if I get to live, okay, it's cool too, I guess. Um, and a lot of people would like maybe even a Jew under the law would assume that they, again, uh, assuming they have eternal life, uh, because they're keeping the law. And so they, you know, when they hear this good news, again, it, it's something they already thought they had. Now they realize it. Now they have it. Yes. But so, you know, for me personally, I, I can see a lot of reasons that, you know, in fact, I would t- tend to think the only people that really thought they were under cr- condemnation, would they really have that elation? And uh, I'm just such a person. I, I had that. Uh, in fact, I, I think most of my life, I, I assumed I got to go to heaven because Jesus died for my sins. But then I started getting... Uh, started reading the scriptures that didn't understand them and started re- reading some of these things that Jesus was saying, you know, pluck out your eye, whatnot. I, t- I knew they couldn't be true deep down, but at the same time, I couldn't refute them. And it just, they tormented me for uh, many years, well, probably a good year and a half to two years, where to the point where I, I literally felt like, I think I came close to death a couple times. Uh, so I, I could, again, I, I see your point, but I think a lot of people, again, assume they already have it. Or they assume that they cease to exist. So, uh, okay, well, change of plans. But, uh, you know, I guess that's good news. Again, I, I just think a lot of people are, uh, are uh, again, just very existential in their thinking. I, I, I will have to, okay, respond. We're doing follow-ups. Can I respond? That? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, I, I see what you're saying. I have a hard time imagining that. Because I was very, well, yeah, existential. I, I kind of just, I guess I wouldn't say I was existential because I, to me that, that implies some sort of like um, uh, aloofness or indifference. I dreaded, uh, I dreaded my own mortality. Um, however, I thought, you know, I was, I was resigned to, to the idea that there was no way to possibly know uh, what would happen before we die until it's too late, right? And um uh, you know, uh, that, that somehow seemed like a better outcome than finding out someone had ultimate authority over me. <laughs> and the thing is, though, is that it's not just that you're not just joyous because you were under condemnation. I like I agree, Ben, I never I, I was in denial about God and all of these things. So I didn't really feel under condemnation, except the condemnation to mortality, to death itself, not hell, just death itself. Um, and then to find out that uh, it, it's not so much just that, okay, you're not going to just cease to exist or, or whatever, like oblivion you imagine, but that you actually are going to live uh, eternally and happily ever after uh, uh, paradise, like you're beyond your wildest dreams. Um, and that it, and it's not just so much like a match, you know, oh, I'm so excited about all the fun, all the fun toys God's going to give me in eternity. No, it's the fact that you know that you get to have a happy ending. You get to stop fearing uh, what's... Uh, <laughs> Because that, that's the thing I, 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 you know, it's amazing that I never realized it when I was an unbeliever that um, life, it, well, and I did eventually, that's, you know, and right before I became a believer, I realized what a cruel, sadistic, futile experience uh, existence was if there wasn't a sure promise of, uh, uh, of an eternity, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in happiness, uh, you know, like not, not an eternity in this state, but an actual, like, you know, happily ever after, like we all have this archetypal, uh, uh understanding of what that is, uh, you know, paradise. Right. Um, and, um, where you don't have to be afraid, you don't have to be afraid of what's coming because I remember back as just a little kid, had, uh, I was, I couldn't even sleep by myself and it partly, yeah, I was scared of like of demons and things like that. Uh, sleep paralysis, but it, more than anything, the dor- demons tormented me, I believe, uh, because I did have sleep paralysis. But I think before the sleep paralysis even would kick in, it was when I'd fall asleep. And I started uh, from such a young age uh, going, like I, I would try not to, but I would realize that um, when I'd go lay down at sleep at night, I would, I would start to realize about how in just a few years, surely someone I love dearly would be dead, you know, especially like my grandmother. And that that would just be the first of many. And there was no escaping it and no avoiding it. And there was, you know, as a little kid, you look forward to the future. You think about how you can get driver's license one day, blah, blah, blah. But I, I was too tormented by the fact that I would eventually one day lose my, my loved ones, my parents, things like this, to even allow myself to look forward to those milestones. Because as soon as I would even think to, 
a thought would come in my mind. Yeah. Would granny be dead by then? By the time you're 16, probably like, or what, you know, what if, what if your dad's dead by then? Like I couldn't even, I had no joy from such a young age um, because of the, 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 the uh, cruelty of death. Um, and I've said it before, I'll say, you know, I'll say it many times, you know, why do we love with a love that it demands eternity without the promise of tomorrow? It just was, it's, it's a, it's a cognitive dissonance that most unbelievers live in their whole lives and they don't understand it. That's really what underlies their misery. Uh, because you're, you're as a human, you cannot reconcile those two things. You cannot reconcile the fact that you're, um, kind of accumulating these, uh, people that you treasure and these moments that you treasure these memories and without, without at least having, maybe you have a false belief, you know, maybe you believe in a false God and a false religion and a false afterlife. That's one thing, but for the unbelieving, like you're talking about with the existential, uh, type people, um, they're basically insane all the time because they've never reconciled these two most fundamental uh, aspects of human existence and it torments them subconsciously all the time because what is the point of anything that you're doing and the farther you go on the more you go the longer you live the more children you have the you know the longer you're with your husband or your wife and the deeper you love them uh the the more cruel <laughs> your existence is because you believe that uh, most likely it's all for literally nothing and your life is shorter you know it, it might as well be a mayfly you know when it comes to our our consciousness and you know, how humans are you know uh we have such a tiny short lifespan with the with the way that you know the, the depth of our emotions and the and our experiences it's it's it, and, and the fact that it doesn't motivate more people to realize that they really need to get serious about figuring out what they can figure out about why we're you know why we're here and and, and and also just to see that Genesis explains it all, and only Genesis does explains exactly that very conundrum about the human nature uh, and the human condition, um, and gives an the, the only the only promise that makes sense, the only explanation for any of these things um, when you when you compare um, the 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 fact that we, we we've never managed to accept death, even though supposedly according to evolution. We've always known death. Why would it be so unbearable then? Why would we have never figured out a way to like, you know, truly cope with it? Why does it torment us the way it does? I know it tormented me before I ever even lost anyone. So I would disagree though, that, that, uh, that people just like, like, like a lot of people that don't share it, like they just like, you know, uh, ho-hum about the whole thing, because I think a lot of people are under a condemnation that uh, is different than lordship. You know, it's just the condemnation of, of the uh, inevitability of death with no answers and not just death. Death is like your, my own death. I never worried about really. Uh, it, it was the death of my loved ones. And although you believing doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that that it doesn't necessarily fix that problem unless you, you know, manage to, to help bring loved ones to faith. But the point is, is that, you, you know, you're, you're excited to find a solution that it is possible at least to 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 uh, for you and your loved ones to spend eternity together um and so i i i, I do think more people uh, if they don't consider these things i think they should but um i think that's why i tend to think that uh a lot of people i think it's really like well heather explained it you know and heather uh i'm so glad she's actually you know come on the panel i could tell heather you're not like the most like at first the most outgoing extroverted person but then once you're and, and I'm kind of like that, like I'm nervous about the approach of it, but then once it's happening, I'm like, you know, totally, uh, I don't, I can talk to anybody, but um, I don't, uh, I don't like to feel like I'm imposing on people. So sometimes for me, um, like I could never street preach. I just don't know how any, but it's like, I, I really admire that, but I, I don't know if I could ever do it. Um, so I think that a lot of times it's just kind of like our own selfish, um, you know, our, our, our weaknesses, what makes us uncomfortable. Um, and some people are more driven by that than others. Um, you know, and I think a lot of men, especially men are not super uh, communicative in, in general, like, you know, like a lot of men at least. And so um, I think you'll probably let, like, I can imagine a lot of guys that get saved, uh, but they're not, they never ever become like real serious about it, serious about ministry. Uh, they just kind of keep it to themselves, you know, uh, you know, my, my dad is very quiet and reserved um, and he's a very, you know, true, he's a true believer in Jesus and always has been, but you know, my dad is a man of few words. So 
you know, and that, you know, hey, listen, that's going to cost him, you know, probably something internally that he didn't, uh, that he didn't take up, a, you know, a ministry of some form. But, um, you know, I know God understands these things about us. So. Um, All right. Thank you. Uh, well, Sister Lisa uh, has to leave soon. So let, let me give you an opportunity to uh, see if you have any more to say about this question. And, and, and also, if you need to leave, you can give us your your final thoughts, Lisa. Oh, okay. Thank you, Brother Luke. Uh, first, before I uh, begin to, to, to say good evening and uh, it, give my final thoughts, I uh, just want to say, uh, Sister Angel, this is why I asked you to be on my broadcast. Um, oh. See, you come from a totally different perspective than my experience because yeah. I grew up always believing always and, and and you think about things that I would never have an experience with because that's not the position I came from and right. and vice versa. I just yeah and I just love when you when you say some of the things that you say because you made such salient points about uh, things to consider like when you said about why would you have the expectation of eternal in other words i'm going to marry somebody and i want to be with you forever and people uh -huh. make declarations but they don't believe in eternal life or they don't believe there's a god out there somewhere so it, right. it doesn't make sense that they have that expectation in their spirit and in even right. their belief system yet mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't realize the absolute glaring contradiction in that statement right. if they actually believe what they claim they believe that exactly it, <laughs> that was saying yep yep that it, it's a, it's just like a spiritual blind spot it is all, it is like, spiritual blinders and and i think that's when the lord gives us opportunities like what you just did to point out that glaring contradiction that they are actually hardwired for eternity mm -hmm. and the bible talks about that i told you i pointed to that book the gentlemen wrote about eternity in their hearts for people for all cultures yes. around the world okay that have that expectation but but anyway i digress um, I wanted to also say, uh, in, a, in another point, uh, about this question, uh, in that I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry so much. I mean, people who know they have a calling, they know if they're being dis disobedient by not honoring a calling on their life. Right. Okay. It would be unjust for God to judge you for a calling <laughs> that you didn't even know you had. Right. Okay. So, um, but, uh, like, like you said about your dad, like maybe he wasn't, maybe he didn't have a, a calling on his life to do anything it's, other. It's for animals, than, apparently. It's like he's well, the it's most just, kind man maybe, to animals. Maybe, but at the same time, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned how your dad had this friend who was wounded that was a homosexual yeah, and ended yeah, up yeah, essentially sexual. becoming asexual. Right. Well, maybe his, one of his ministry or calling or appointment was to minister to that man. See, we diminish yeah. things and we don't realize, and I'm not saying you did, don't misunderstand me. I'm saying we don't realize we discount things that are critically important. Right. Uh, it, it, it's not the number with God. You remember how he started with 12. So it's not the number necessarily. It's it's the, the actual catching that person he's i'm gonna yeah, make you, you fish might be and a men. special case where you're, you're exactly go after a few really hard cases but all exactly you could do, right? maybe in your whole life you only minister to four people but it, it required right. a constant level of dedication you can't minister to 100 people critically close constant interaction you can't do that you 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 right. you're only one person but two or three maybe four people where you're helping them and nurturing them and leading them and guiding them and directing them and discipling them in a way, hey, that's that's something a lot of people can't even do. So that's why I say y'all get before God and ask him what your ministry is because everybody, you all have something. You all have a gift. And then the, the last thing I want to say is uh, before I jump off tomorrow night at uh, 8 p.m., Pacific. We're going to talk about marriage on the second half of the broadcast and singleness on the first half. I'm going to speak to singleness and I'm going to invite everybody to even come from whatever their perspective is on being single and how they, if they had advice for single people as well. And then the second half of the broadcast, we're going to talk about marriage and both uh, uh, brother Ben and sister Angel are married. They're married believers. So they're going to speak to that as well as minister Fitz. He's going to come and join us for the second 
half of the broadcast. He's been married over 27 years, I believe I have that number right. Uh, oh, right. And he's, yeah, he's going to talk about marriage uh, from the biblical perspective and his experiences. So I think it's going to be fun. I think everybody enjoy it. And we're going to have some other fun topics to discuss tomorrow night with Late Night on, on my channel. For the Most High Jesus, late night with Lisa and friends. And on that note, I got to say good night to everyone. I have fun. It was a wonderful discussion. Great questions, difficult questions. They're getting harder as we go along here. And uh, thank you, Brother Luke, for having me. I appreciate you. God bless you. Sister Angel, Brother Ben, Sister Heather, everyone out there in the chat. Good night. God bless you all. I love you. Love you, Lisa. Good night. Good night to see you tomorrow. All right. All thank right. you. Fun tomorrow. Thank, thank you. you. It's going to be a needed talk tomorrow, you know. Lot, lot yes, of I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Good night, Sister Good Lisa. Night. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm. Good night. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I've got this on my mind. So before before I forget, I might as well say this. Uh, we started a new uh, thing recently where we ask people to, hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe now. And also click the notification bell so that you're notified about uh, all, all the programs coming up. Uh, so please do that if you haven't. Uh, and then also, of course, I'm going to do this right now here. There's a thumbs up. Oh, yeah. I'm going to give us a thumbs up. So if you think we deserve a thumbs up, if you liked it enough to give us a thumbs up, then do it now, please. Luke's uh, going pro. He's going yeah, pro. That, that's supposed to be hopeful. I don't know how it works, but uh, all the all the big channels are all saying, please give us a thumbs up. And and also, I would say share. I Share the, the the video if you if you really liked it and you have somebody in mind you think would benefit, then share it with them. Uh, and Ben's also started. If you haven't noticed, uh, he's he's taking the Friday and the Sunday program and each question making into its own separate video. And so that makes it really nice. So if someone is interested in one of the particular one of the questions particularly, they can zero in on that one and watch it for thirty minutes or an hour instead of for you know, two or two and a half hours to get to it. Uh, all right. I just want to say that while it was on my mind. Uh, okay, Ben, um, can, it, can you look through those questions? And if there's one question that is you think is simpler, maybe shorter than the others, select that one or, or not? Yes, um, I have one. So I think it's not a simple question by any means, but it's one that we probably don't have a whole, each of us probably doesn't have a whole lot to say. So I, I'll use this. Uh, it is true or false. Uh, Paul endorsed being baptized for the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Mm, mm, okay. Well, I'll go first. Uh, no, he, uh, the answer is absolutely false, certainly false. Uh, he's not endorsing it. He's just referring to the people that do it. He's, he's saying this is being done. So if, 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 you're, if you're someone that thinks that you can baptize for the dead, then you certainly have to uh, believe. I, I think uh, you have to understand about the the resurrection is real. I, I, I think it's the resurrection that's connected to that. I can't remember for sure. So he's not really endorsing it or teaching it. He's just recognizing that somebody, some of people believe that, and therefore you need to. You should. Why couldn't you also believe this at least? Um, okay, uh, who wants to go next? I'll just quickly say, uh, yeah, I second that false. I mean, you know, everybody, uh, it's kind of like, uh, there's not, it was before these little Twitter disclaimers, you know, uh, a retweet is, you know, doesn't necessitate endorsement or whatever. It's the same thing. A lot of times people will point to things in scripture that it's just, they're just referring to something, not endorsing and not approving it. And that's why the context is really important. But um, uh, this is how people try to slip little things by, you know, because he said it happens, that must mean that it's good. And you know, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure if uh, if if it were a biblical principle, we might have heard more about it, other than this offhanded reference to it, as if it was something other people do, like not something that God actually instructed or ever explained in the first place. So where did they even get it? <laughs> you know, where did they even get it from? That should be a clue. So. Hey, all right, uh, Sister Heather. This was actually my question, so I will oh. let Ben oh. go. All right, go ahead, Ben. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let me read the verse first of all. Um, first Corinthians fifteen nine. It is you're right, uh, Luke, in the context of the resurrection. Um, and we just pull it up here. I had it here a second ago. 
Yeah, so Paul says, uh, now otherwise, what will they do who are baptized? I'm sorry, let me read it over again. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Um, I believe this is a key verse used by Mormons, actually. Because uh, I think they do baptize the dead. In fact, I think they are really, we're behind a ton of uh, early science in the human genome because they wanted to find out who their relatives were uh, so they could baptize the dead. Uh, I believe that was, what was that? Was I've heard I've heard that. I don't know how true it is, but I've, I've definitely heard that. Um, and uh, what you said, what you guys said about that, uh, what Angel and Luke said could be very well be true. Uh, I don't know if that's the case. Um, it also, when I read it, the first thing that came to my mind was, um, again, you know, we were baptized into Christ. And so in that sense, we were baptized into his death. And so if Paul could be using it in that, in that respect, you know, a, a baptizing, uh, again, I think it, when you hear the word baptized in the Bible, it doesn't necessarily mean water is involved at all. In fact, I think you need to wring the word out in your mind. It means to be immersed with or fully identified with, essentially. Um, and so, again, we, we are fully identified with Christ in his, in, in his both his uh, death and his resurrection. Uh, so if Christ, didn't, if Christ didn't raise, isn't raised, then we, we aren't raised. Uh, and, and that's part of Paul's argument. And uh, so he could be referring to that. And I, I, I saw an allusion, perhaps, into another kind of puzzling passage in 1 Peter 4, where Peter says, Therefore, uh, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And he goes on to talk about, you know, uh, how these Peter's uh, people he's writing to are being uh, spoken evil of because they're no longer partaking in the sins they once did. And, um, and so in that sense, uh, Paul later says, uh, I'm sorry, Peter later says, um, uh, he says, uh, he, he says, for this reason, the gospel was preached to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but to live according to God in the spirit. So it, it's a kind of puzzling. There's a lot of debate. Okay. What does he mean by, for this reason, the gospel was preached to those who are dead? Well, who's he referring to? He's talking about people who are once dead in trespasses and sins, but now are alive to God? Or is he referring to those who are unbelievers and uh, still unbelievers, still dead in their trespasses and sins? And I think there's probably an aspect of both. Um, you know, I, I see it as the gospel being preached to them. Uh, and, you know, while they were alive, they were being ju judged according to the flesh. So just like Jesus, when he when he uh, was alive, alive, when it talks about, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also in the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. By meaning that, he means, that, okay, since Christ died and he suffered in the flesh, not that he ever sinned, but he he ceased suffering from sinners, you know, people who are persecuting him. And so, in the same way, we have, should have that same mind that not only should we... Um, uh, not really take any heed to what unbelievers say, but all, we also should be done with sin. We shouldn't be partaking uh, of it a, a anymore um, because we died to it. And so, in that sense, we should arm ourselves with the idea that we also have ceased from sin because we died with Christ. And so, in that sense, uh, he could be using baptized for the dead um, with respect to uh, just being dead to, dead to your former self. Uh so it is a puzzling passage, but I, I definitely don't believe it. Any, there's no way that. Uh, well, first of all, so we know that water baptism has doesn't bring eternal salvation whatsoever. It's just an, an outward expression of an inward reality, and um, it has no dependency or uh, bearing on one's eternal salvation whatsoever. And so uh, it would be quite a leap to say that uh, Paul's teaching uh, that dead people. Who were never who had their who have had their chance to believe, and whether they did or not, that it's come it's 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 a foregone conclusion. They're either with Christ or they're now uh, under condemnation. Uh, baptized water baptizing is not going to uh, 
make one iota of difference to their eternal reality, so. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Sister Heather. All right, um, I just want to say, first of all, that I very much enjoy the wisdom of everybody on here. I, I really do. And that being said, that is the reason this question was submitted. Um, and th I think that this is a really good lesson for all of us to learn, um, especially if we're, we're a little bit newer in our study of the scripture. Um, when we have a question, we see a verse that we don't understand. It is so important because I didn't understand this verse, which is why I asked the question. Um, when we have a question we don't understand, it's so important to go to our brothers and sisters in Christ who have been saved longer, who have an understanding of what the word says and who can explain it to us. Because my insight on this subject is I think you guys hit the nail on the head. I didn't understand it before tonight. So, um, yeah. And listen, there's uh, there's other places that you can ask your questions. Um, I know that there are some brothers and sisters in Christ who are available on programs like Discord where you can go and you can talk to somebody who might have an answer for you. Um, you can always contact anybody on the panel. Um, if you can't contact us directly or if you don't have contact information for us directly, you can always email the church, church of the eternally secure at gmail.com. Ask your questions. It might take a little bit, so get be patient, but you will get an answer. I promise. Um, and I promise that God will speak wisdom through the people He is He's appointed to be on this panel. Um, and I I very much am grateful to my brothers and sisters in Christ for even being considered to be on this panel um, because I am fairly new in, in um, the, my knowledge of the truth of the gospel. I've, I've been saved for about 20 years, but I didn't really understand it until about two or three years ago. So um it's it, I, I I feel like a babe in Christ sometimes. And especially as I'm reading through the Bible, I'll find a verse and I'm like, I just don't understand what this what this verse means. Another one that um, I struggled with and actually my husband asked me about it and I struggled to give him an answer was the the one where um, Elisha basically six two bears on on um, some kids and I didn't understand it until. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Ben brought it up and was uh, was talking about it. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. So then I can scratch that question off my list now because it it tied the the ends together for me. And so I think this was a really good question to end on tonight because I think it's an encouragement to especially the younger believers in Christ. And that's not necessarily age, but, you know, your your time in in the Lord Seek counsel from those who have might have an answer for you. And if they don't have an answer, they will gladly do the research and help you find your answer. Okay. All right. Thank you. I will. We're very happy to hear that uh, uh, you didn't have an answer. And that's why you submitted the question. And now you, uh, you actually helped. So I'm happy to hear that. Also, Heather, um, I, I would just say to Heather, um, I feel like I, I'm a new believer too, honestly. It's, you know, I've been, it took me probably a good seven years to just to overcome myself, essentially, to understand, okay, hey, I, I know I believe this, but there was a lot of stuff I had to go through. I mean, I I, I really uh, came from, a, 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 I wasn't ever really... Um, uh, resentful of God or, or critical of Christians. I always uh, accepted it as truth, but I never really thought about it. And then when I started really deeply thinking about it, then I had started a, a lot of baggage I had to deal with. And I, I probably struggled with that for like seven, seven or eight years. It's only probably in the last five 
where I kind of overcame that, kind of like, okay, do I really believe this or not, or is it, I, I did, but I didn't, it was just a cognitive dissonance type of thing, just, again, uh, I think a lot of people are like that, where they're, they'll, they'll see one thing, they'll be really, you know, they'll read a, a, a section of scripture, an aspect of scripture, and they'll be totally into it, and then they'll live their life, or think, or even think uh, completely inconsistently, with, consistent with that truth, um, and so for me, it, it took me a long time just to get all that garbage out of my thinking. And it's only probably in the last three years where I've really been, really been established in grace. And actually, maybe only the last two years where I've been super established in grace, where I think I, I'm at the, established to the point where I think God really wants to be established. Where some people think, uh, some of the things I say are probably radical, but I know they're not. They're just, it's just a super uh, strong desire. And I, I, I think uh, hard for God. Um, to understand his grace and to understand that how much he he values life and and to see things how he sees them and uh, just a really s strong desire to really under understand scripture not like okay I have a good answer but really okay is that the right is that really what's saying and uh you know what's the depth of it and what's the height of it and you know I, that's what I really like to do and so there are certain areas of scripture I feel like I'm like uh. I feel like I have a great insight in because I, I I was desperate and God I think God loves that that uh, you know when he, you're totally dependent on Him He'll show you those things, um, but there's a lot in areas of Scripture I haven't really studied yet. I, I'll I'll hear answers from people, and uh, and I haven't really studied it, but I'll say okay yeah that's a good answer. Let's plug that in as a tentative answer. But I always want to circle back around and see okay is this what God you know reading the whole context and everything I know uh, is this really what it's saying, and um, and I think that'll be, I think that'll take a lifetime, <laughs> you know. So I don't think that any of us were are infallible by any stretch of the imagination. I know you weren't saying that, but um, I, I hope I, don't, I hope I don't come off like I anyone thinks that I think I'm infallible because I'm I'm definitely uh, still learning. But I do know that soteriology uh, is something I, I'm solid on. So um, I've got at least that going for me. Well, no, I didn't mean to make it sound like um, like you guys were any better or anything like that. Um, just, just that I feel humbled because, um, I don't consider myself to have the knowledge that some of you have, or that most of you have rather. And because of that, um, I, I very much value your wisdom and, and your insight on questions that I find as I'm studying the Bible. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, I think that was a really good question to finish up on it because it did uh, uh, take just the right amount of time. <laughs> good choice, Ben. Um, okay. I guess it's time now for us to start uh, giving our summaries and closing re remarks. Uh, uh, let's say if, if there's something, someone in the chat room that uh, now you have something pertaining to the discussion tonight that uh, you want us to respond to here at the end. Uh, put it in all caps, and maybe we can do that. Uh, I did notice that somebody, uh, Michaela, she said that she submitted a question and she's wondering what happened. Uh, Michaela, I remember uh, receiving your question, and when we get a new question, we uh, add it to a file that we have of questions. And so I remember your question coming in. We do have it saved uh, and uh, we're gonna definitely answer it. But um, it, we, we, what we're trying to do is uh, the questions that came in earliest, answer them first and the newest questions, you know, uh, since other people have already been waiting for a while, uh, we, we obviously wanna give answer theirs before a brand new question. So, uh, we do want you to, everybody, submit your, submit your questions on Friday for the True False uh, program. And then on Sundays, uh, we have the just broader uh, where you can phrase your question however you like. Uh, um, we need more of those, too. But uh, so it's not like we're, uh, we have so many questions we don't want anymore. But uh, at the same time, when you do submit a question, uh, please be aware that it may take a little while for us to get around to answering it because sometimes they pile up. Um, okay, let's uh, let's give our uh, uh, closing remarks now. Um, start with Sister Angel. Uh, what did you think of the uh, the discussion and the time together tonight, Sister? Was it a fun fellowship, Friday? Yes, it was uh, as always, and um, 
I I dropped out a couple times, but I, I was you know you guys uh, you guys took over you know the wheel while I was gone. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, I felt uh, I felt like uh, everything was just pretty seamless, and um, I'm really enjoying the way that we're doing these follow up questions and responses. I think that that's uh, I don't know. I, I think I, I enjoy that a whole lot better because it gives a little bit like so people can submit questions, but also we can kind of uh, deter. Oh, sorry, bird chirping noise has been downloaded from my my buddies just started to come on while I'm talking. Okay, um, I think it, it kind of gives us room too to kind of uh, uh, take the discussion in different directions once uh, you know once we you know got on a topic, which I think has just been really great. Like it's it's uh, amped up the fun like ten times at least. It's a really good idea. Um, but um, I'm very excited about tomorrow's show with Lisa and. Um, uh, ben and, and and you know brother Fitz is going to be there and I think I hope you guys will tune in because uh I, you know I have I just don't hear this discussed very much especially with you know uh you know truly uh truly believing Christians who are are biblically based I think uh, it's going to be a really cool uh uh juxtaposition and talking about um the biblical uh uh kind of, the, like biblical intention of marriage and also you know dispelling a lot of this uh, you know the, the propaganda basically that we've been uh i know i was contaminated with to where um you know uh people don't even imagine that marriage can be <laughs> anything but misery after the first few years and it's just an absolute lie we were designed uh we were designed with marriage in mind um so and also you know people are uh, a lot of people are find themselves single and they're believers and uh lisa wants to talk about um talk about that and all of its uh and all of the ramifications of that and i think that that's a really interesting subject too because certainly there's a place uh there's a place for people that remain single and um uh really kind of uh, i've noticed a lot of them tend to be when they're believers they really devote themselves to to study a lot so i uh hope you guys will tune in and um uh heather what you said was just so sweet and i know exactly how you feel uh, and that's why i think it's um it's almost like a cool reference tool, especially with Ben doing these clips, because not only do I benefit from getting uh, these answers, these are always the first people I run to if I have something I'm not sure of, um, something I really don't understand, but also with these little clips, it's great for to help other people, to help other people understand. You know, quickly you can you can uh, refer them to something and actually for once have a panel of people who are really actually clear on the gospel discussing these little uh, kind of like the minutia of scripture that people get uh, confused about. So um, I love you guys. And uh, yeah, I uh, will see you a lot. Most of you tomorrow night. Hey, all right. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh... Uh, now, uh, Heather, I was—I don't remember if uh, you, your last remark was your summary or if that was the end of the final question. There, I uh, kind of you kind of get some summary. It was when, a follow-up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Heather. Let's hear your uh, your summary and closing remarks. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, it's it's been a a great night. I've I've really enjoyed. The questions I've enjoyed the time that we've spent together. I've enjoyed the fellowship. Um, I've gotten to peek into the chat a couple of times, and it's it's looked pretty edifying. So I'm I'm excited about that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I I really do. I value the time that we spend together like this. And then I know that it takes a lot of extra work for you to split the the Friday programs up. But I just want you to know that it's very appreciated and we appreciate everything that you do. So, but um, I am I'm probably going to be in the chat for a little while tomorrow, um, but that program tends to go really, really long. Although last week I ended up staying up the whole entire time. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> it was so funny. I was sitting there and I what I like to do when I'm listening to a program like that, that I know is going to be um really edifying but you know a little bit long i i like to um play a video game and just you know do something that doesn't require a lot of my attention like mining in minecraft or something um and right. i i was mining and i was listening and it was just such a good conversation that i didn't even realize how late it was and then lisa said well we're i know we went a little bit late tonight and i'm like late what time is it <laughs> 
I know. I know in real life. I had stayed up until almost four o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. listening. <laughs> it was so funny. But um, yeah, I, I very much enjoy that program as well. But um, I, I just want to say good night, everybody. Thank you all for being here and, and for participating in the chat and in the panel. I, um, it's been a great night. Thank you. All right, uh, Brother Ben, let's hear your uh, summary. I, I echo everyone's uh, sentiments. I also very much uh, look forward to these programs. Um, we could use some more questions for true and false. Uh, so if anything that comes to mind, please email them to the uh, to the church uh, email account, which is churchoftheeternallysecure at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, I, I, I it's I it uh, I, I wanted to break out the the. Uh, the uh questions for a long time but there was a kind of a um uh a, a confluence of things that happened the timing was perfect lately where i got the software understood the software easy enough and had a little bit of time over the christmas break to uh try to learn it and understand exactly how to make um the cuts and whatnot it's not that difficult but um just having a template so i can do it over and over again uh, so it's not time consuming every time. Uh, that's what I was able to do. So, um, and again, I, I, you know, I'm a computer guy, but uh, I don't know all things computer related. So a lot of people think, oh, you computer guy. Uh, it's like kind of saying like, oh, you're you're a brain surgeon, so you must know about, um, uh, you know, tonsillitis or whatever. It's it's very specialized. So I'm kind of specialized in that way too. So um, it 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 still is a, uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm definitely uh, willing to. Uh, Accept help from anyone in terms of, especially with artistic uh, direction or aesthetics, um, could use a lot of uh, help in that respect. You know, again, just we 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 solicited uh, uh, help out before a call for help to you know just artwork that we could use on the different programs like the the show cards or the thumbnails, uh, a new church logo, uh, things of that nature. It'd be really great. Um, but other than that, I will see you guys tomorrow on Lisa's program and. Uh, Lisa said that even her mother might show up. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but either way, uh, uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, brother. Uh, well, uh, Heather, uh, just curious, uh, was your sister a- able to uh, be here tonight? No, um, she had a family situation with her husband's family come up, so she wasn't able to make it. But um, hopefully I can convince her to listen to the replay so if if she does hi lauren <laughs> mm-hmm. okay great um all right well well i want to respond to uh, angel and heather a couple of things that they said uh you, angel was talking about marriage and the difficulty of marriage and so m- my wife and i got married uh august 26 1979 so that's 41 years ago and i can tell you that uh it was not easy for a long time. It took me it took me approximately twenty years to train my wife properly, but uh, once I got her trained, uh, it's been pretty smooth sailing ever since. Brother Luke, does your wife by chance listen to this program? I'm looking at her. I hope she's not. At, at her you might get yourself in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, From actually, my experience, it's the wife that trains the husband. Yeah, it's it's really more true of her training me uh, because she's she's like a pit bull. She's so persistent in getting and imposing her ways on me. So I've had to make a lot of uh, adjustments and, and to accommodate her. And so, uh, but I, I think really the truth is we we both had to make some compromises. And uh, so that was really my attempt to humor regarding training my wife. Um, the uh, the idea, Heather, that you brought up about um, uh, you know you don't have um, you know all the answers and you you are using uh, this as a as a resource to get some answers and uh, I, I'm, that's wonderful. I'm really happy. I hope that that's uh, what many people are are gaining from this uh, the CES programs. Uh, but you know, I got saved in December of '86. So that's uh, 30, 34 years ago. Yeah, 34 years ago. And I, I have been studying the Bible uh, all those years. 
Uh, I have never had like a year go by or five years go by where I lost interest. And, you know, I've consistently been studying it all that time. And I will tell you that there's so much I don't know and don't understand. I've made a great effort. Uh, and uh, um, I've said this quite often, uh, but I, I really do believe it. And they, we, we absolutely have to get just two things right. And that we need to, we need to understand who Jesus is and how to get saved. Everything else, you could be wrong. I could be wrong. We don't have to get it all right, but we better be right on that. And, uh, but um, there are many subjects in the Bible. Almost every subject or question has uh, at least two or more possible answers. And what I would encourage everybody to do is um, try to listen to the, the other side of every argument. Um, rather than, you know, you have your teacher, you know, I, and I've had first Dr. Walter Martin, who was the Bible answer man for about 40 years on the radio. And uh, I listened to him, got his audio tapes. I got his book, Kingdom of the Cults, and, and he was my primary resource. And then for many years, I relied on Dr. Peter Ruckman. I have about 40 of his books, and, and he was my go-to resource. Uh, but eventually what I learned is that uh, I, rather than, even though I admire certain teachers, and, and uh, I realize that even they, as, as scholarly as they, they are, uh, the, nobody has it all right. I don't believe anybody can explain every verse in the Bible exactly right. Uh, so I think it's wise to, to always look at both sides all the time uh, to consider whatever your position is, maybe you're wrong. I've been wrong. I made a video eight times I was wrong, wrong and changed my mind. So uh, um, I, I believe that uh, for me, the conversation gets interesting when someone says I'm wrong and, and, I, and I say, okay, let's, let me hear your point of view. And that's when it gets interesting. If I hear someone just agreeing with me, I don't need to hear that. I, I, that's, I already know that. Uh, there's a saying that if, if two men in business always agree, one of them is unnecessary. So um, uh, that's, the, that's the approach that I've taken. And I, I urge everybody to do that, be, be eager to, to hear the uh, your opposing viewpoints and, and, and give them a fair hearing and consider them. There's a chance we're wrong. Uh, all the different subjects and, and uh, conclusions that I've come to uh, in my studies, there's a few things that I have absolute 100% confidence. And then there's other things where my level of confidence is, is varies. Um, and some things I'm really quite unsure of. So uh, I, I believe that's as much as you effort you put into studying the Bible, I think that's what you can expect, that you're not going to you're not going to be absolutely confident in everything. If you are, then maybe it reflects on uh, what I would call, you know, egotism, where you, you just think you got it all figured out perfectly. Um, uh, now, uh, Angel, Heather, and Ben, um, when we finish, uh, if you could stay for a couple of minutes, I have one thing I need to ask you after we're done. Uh, so, um, this is Friday. It certainly was a fun fellowship Friday. I really had a great time tonight and, uh, I, I needed to have a good time. Uh, and, uh, so join us Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern on the same channel for our Sunday church service. We look forward to seeing you all then. Bless you all in the name of our great savior, God, Jesus.